the greatest show on earth. I'm Dave Sparr, I'm the interim city manager. I'm gonna welcome you here this morning. We're gonna continue from yesterday um, on the education portion because we had a little power interruption. And I'd like to interrupt your power now with your cell phone. So if you could all please silence your cell phones for us, because we've got a great panel and we want you to hear and listen to the panel. Yesterday was a great start. It was a year in the making, um, several partners that came together on that. And then we got an announcement that the power was out. And then after that, we got an email that there are surplus funds in the governor's budget. And so we started work with uh, Senator McGuire's office and several other people who are in the audience. And we're lining up funding for Blue Economy and possibly projects for the Harbor and for aquaculture. So what a day it was yesterday. So I'm gonna turn the podium over and to the um, group up here to finish the education section. And you're gonna have a very educational day today. So welcome to Fort Bragg. Hi everybody, good morning. Thanks for um, having us. We are a little bit sad we didn't get to finish the day yesterday. It would have been a nice follow-up after the fisherman's panel, but we'll bring up a lot of those points. We are here to talk about education, entrepreneurship, and job training, which when we originally started talking about that, we thought was an interesting kind of mix of topics. But when the panel started discussing this via Zoom, we really saw a, a really nice synergy with all of our organizations, Mendo College, West Business Development Center, and Sea Grant, and the Noyo Center for Marine Science. I apologize. I'm Sheila Siemens, the director of the Noyo Center for Marine Science here in town. Um, it's Thank you, that's sweet. It's really nice to see a lot of the faces that I used to know in my former job at the state and um, so many people that I'm working with now. So we have, a, we have a shortened time, so we're gonna get right to it. I'm gonna introduce Marianne first. She's the director of West Business Development Center. She um, comes from the private, the, the private sector. So she brings some really great uh, experience into her nonprofit world. And she's been a tremendous partner with uh, the Noyo Center up to date. So Marianne, you wanna go first? Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to be here. And it was great yesterday, the presentations. Uh, I have the, the good fortune today to talk to you a little bit about Mendocino County. For those of you who might be new to our area, not just Fort Bragg, because of the county as a whole. Um, as I titled our presentation here, Possibilities Untapped. And I think that's what we're all here to talk about today and to really be uh, aware of, and especially in Mendocino County. Um, the people, we love their county, and we love it for a variety of reasons. Coastal scenery, farm to table cuisine, abundant recreational activities. If you're new to this area and you haven't seen not only the coast, but the inland valleys and the wineries, please do take advantage of that at some point, either the time while you're here, or do come back and spend some time with us, because it truly is a beautiful and lovely county. However, like most counties in the country and in our state, the pandemic fallout has really uh, challenged us in ways that we really didn't understand the long tail effects of this. When COVID hit, we knew it was a health crisis, but what we all are feeling now two years later is very much the economic crisis. At the height of the pandemic, 31% of our small businesses in our county closed. The dem demographics of the county rapidly changed with a lot of the younger population moving out of the county and back home to parents and friends who live in other parts of the country. We experienced a severe drop in our ability to um, supply the workforce that was needed, especially in tourism. And on top of that, for our county in particular, as a lot in Northern California, we had the additional existential crises of wildfire and housing, which has always been there even before the pandemic, but the pandemic really exacerbated that. So now more than ever is a time for us to really be coordinating our efforts and to really trying to tackle what 
the needs are for our rural region. You wanna? The one thing I wanted to say in my next slide, it talks about the opportunities. One of the opportunities that occurred with the pandemic is almost overnight, a county where many of the residents were afraid of technology changed. And this is significant. That positive awareness and need to adopt technology and software and utilization of technology for every aspect, whether it's small businesses, whether it's hospitals, whether it's education, literally changed overnight. And I, how do I know that? I know that because we had been doing technology training classes for years. And after the pandemic, those classes went from five people, 10 people, to 150 people, 200 people. We just overnight became a county that learned how to utilize technology and are still willing to learn it because the fear is gone. The other thing that was learned from the pandemic is really the difference between independence versus isolation. And I think this is one of the, the big lessons that all of us learned is that it's great to be independent and to be on our own, but we really can't be isolated. We need our neighbors. We need our community. We need our healthcare workers, our teachers, our government officials. We need everybody really coming together. And that in and of itself allows us now to be thinking about these opportunities that lie ahead. And those, of course, include the things that we're talking about here today and this week. Diversification of industries and diversification of the economy. Entrepreneurship and small business development is key to any successful change that we want to see in our county. Technology adoption and innovation utilizing that technology in our small businesses is going to be very, very important. And then, of course, the green jobs and the infrastructure that we need. These are opportunities now that we could see clearly because we're, the pandemic has kind of opened that door for us to see that there needs to be new ways to utilize the assets that we have here in our county. So where do we begin? I thought it was great yesterday hearing the fishermen talk. I thought it was fabulous yesterday hearing plans for the Noyo Harbor District. I think those are things that we have to sort of rise up to help uh, our community as a whole. I think many of you here represent opportunities for us to form public private partnerships. And as David said at the beginning, you know, timing is everything. So it's wonderful. I mean, it's sad that the power went out, but it's great that when it came back on, there was an email about surplus funds being happening. And those are the things that now we, all of us, all of us here in the room, all of us doing this great work have to be listening for more than ever before, um, because it's the only way we're gonna ignite entrepreneurship. I think Paula's presentation talking about uh, the innovation hub in San Diego. While we may not create something exactly like that here, we're gonna create something like that here that works for our community and that works for our area. And the innovation hub, creating an innovation hub here is gonna be really essential to long-term growth. So the other thing that is um, something we have to focus on is how do we begin to improve the workforce here? And that's part of this panel and what Shauna and, and um, both Sheila will be talking about. And you heard a little bit yesterday from Tim Karras talking about it from the college perspective. Education is a long-term investment and you have to start now and you have to change it. You have to keep changing and innovating even with our educational uh, uh, resources that we have here. And I think that is on, uh, on the docket. The other thing, and finally, that is really, um, I think, core, and you will hear this at least amongst our internal stakeholders here in the county, is innovating in ways to help us with affordable housing. It's a crisis all over California. It's especially true here in Mendocino County. So I just wanna say that there are a lot of good ideas that are on the horizon, and I hope all of you will be listening for this and helping to support it. 
this Noyo collective that Sarah kind of initiated and gradually is nurturing fanning the flames to make this grow is I think an important first step. I think we should take advantage of the innovation hub funds that come up. I hope that we can develop some type of entrepreneur and residency program that's community driven. The fish market, of course, is the, a great beginning for down at the, at the Noyo um, Center. And of course, the Ocean Science Center. I think that is the, the jewel in the crown that we all hope to see rise very, very soon. A little word about us. Uh, I am the CEO of West Business Development Center. For those of you who aren't familiar with what we do, we've been here for 34 years serving the small business community with free technical assistance. We are both a host to the SBDC as well as to the Women's Business Center. And we run signature programs in addition to our uh, free one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling and workshops but we have a program called Start at Mendocino with our graduating class, our second graduating class happening in June. We have Central Latino West, which is specifically designed for the Hispanic business community. And then we also have developed back in 2018 when the initial fires, the great fires happened in, in Mendocino County, we have an entire program designed to help businesses recover quickly and rapidly from any kind of natural disaster. So we are here and we are happy to be serving our community. We love our small businesses and we hope that you will take advantage as you go out into the community to support them in whatever way you can. And on a final note, you all know this, oceans are indeed our future. The restoration of them, the sustainability issues will help all of us continue to thrive and we will be on a new on a new level very, very soon. So thank you, thank you for being here and thank you for supporting Mendocino County. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Marianne, that was excellent and um, hopeful and yet grim at the same time. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce next Shauna O, oh, who is the director of California Sea Grant. Shauna comes with an incredible depth of experience on the state. We're lucky to have her. We're even luckier to have her have family here in this community. So uh, we hope we get to see you more often. She and I worked together quite a bit when I was at the state, but now I hope we have some new opportunities to work together here in town. So Shauna, you wanna come up? It really is my pleasure to be here. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Sea Courage Training Program, but I want to take the opportunity since I'm here to tell you about Sea Grant. For those of you who are wondering, what is Sea Grant, right? And maybe perhaps I can answer why um, Luke and um, Kevin said yes to Sarah. So again, I want to thank all the sponsors, um, all the local sponsors, as well as the, the staff that worked with Luke and Kevin to put this uh, amazing event together. I know how much work it takes to put this on. It doesn't seem like it, but from the flyer to every little detail, even um, IT. So I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> uh oh. <clears throat> okay, what can I say? There we go. <laughs> Um, we can do some things verbally. So I'm um, speaking on behalf of Teresa Talley, who's the project lead for the Sea Career Training Program. She's also our extension director. So on that project is also um, Luke, Kevin, as well as some of you might know, Carrie or Carolyn Culver, and then Leon Gua. So that is the project team that I'll be presenting for. And this is uh, a program that's been in let's see, in preparation or been worked on since 2018. So first from some funding from the National Fisheries and Wildlife Foundation and the Betty Moore, um, the Moore Foundation, as well as the Packard Foundation, and has led to an evolution of current funding from NOAA Sea Grant that's going to now expand that. So what we were going to talk about is that uh, there's a California Commercial Fishing Apprenticeship Program 
that was launched in 2020. So right before the pandemic began, but it really the collaborative aspect of it was that it was developed with um, several fishing um, associations. Okay, great. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, got it. So Sea Grant is a federal university partnership between NOAA, for some of you, I think I don't have to define that acronym, but NOAA and 34 university-based state programs throughout. So every coast, coastal state, including Guam and Puerto Rico. So by legislation, we are to initiate programs um, and support research, education, and out outreach. And we really do serve as a bridge between the needs of um, citizens, local businesses, and local governments with assets at the university and the federal and state government. So I put the mission here so you can read it, but what I want to tell you that we achieved this mission with our partners. So I want to underscore the partnership. Many of you are here today, current partners, and we're looking for, for future partners because there's no way we could achieve this mission without the partners. And we do this, um, the, the three-tiered approach that you're going to hear again and again is research, it's on the left, the green circle, education um, in the middle, and then outreach, the purple circle. So the outreach really is the transfer of scientific information to users through communication and extension. In education, we do that with training um, in the development of workforce for current and future, right? So, and then research is both basic and applied research. I think you're gonna hear about some of the kelp recovery research program, that was something that we funded in partnership with the state of California through the Ocean Protection Council. Okay, so as part of a national network, we um, adhere to these four national focus areas, healthy coastal ecosystems, sustainable fisheries, aquaculture, resilient coastal communities and economies, and education, um, public information and training, also very commonly referenced as environmental literacy and workforce development. So that's, that's what we're talking about. So the four focus areas really drive our required investment. Again, those four things, um, research, which we fulfill through grants and funding, and then education in the form of many form in the fellowships. And there are several policy fellows here um, joining us um, here today. And then outreach again, which we do through programming and communication and extension. So underneath that, you see workforce development and our a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, and access. And that is a cross cut. So it, that, those themes cross cut all four functions, major functions of our program. So that's what we do. Okay, this is extension. So remember the outreach transfer of scientific information. So you'll see we have a team from Northern California all the way down to San Diego. And we, you see why so many down there. So we're headquartered and administered by University of California, San Diego at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So the grant from NOAA is run through there, is administered. And we do with that state federal partnership means we need state funding for us to leverage the NOAA dollars. So you're gonna hear from several of our extension specialists and extension fellows throughout the, the day, but this is just a map to show you. So we work and function as a statewide team. Okay, so the, what is our workforce development goal? Provide and support training and education opportunities that advance the development of a viable careers in coastal and marine related STEM, social science, and resource use and management disciplines. So one of the approaches we do this, we could produce and collaboratively implement training programs and educational materials. So I want you to keep in mind these things we want to do with the fishermen, with the aquaculturists, with the farmers, so a collaborative. So not just us telling them, but what are the needs, what's the industry needs, and what's the training needs here in Fort Bragg? Okay, so despite what we heard yesterday, and I think all of us know there is a decrease in the commercial fishing fleet in California and elsewhere, but despite that, there is renewed interest. We heard about it yesterday, and we read about it, local and blue jobs, diverse domestic seafood sources and types, as well as emerging and recovering fisheries and local food systems. So this is why um, there is going to be that this, there's this need for training, right? And you heard about the graying of the fleet as well as some emerging aquaculture opportunities. So the training is really needed to take advantage of these fishing, farming and direct marketing opportunities as well as to navigate 
uh, what we heard about, right? The very complex permitting and regulations, as well as some skills that are needed to perform these jobs, like working at sea or at farms and associated job hazards. And there has been, and always has been, and will be, right? Interest in by the fishermen or by aquaculture practitioners to participate in science as well as the management. So, our program responded by launching a pilot of the California Commercial Fishing Apprenticeship Program in 2020. And then now we're in the middle of really gearing up to launch the Sea Career Training Program. And that's to improve that commercial fishing apprenticeship program. And then the expansion would include aquaculture as well as strengthening communication among other Sea Grant programs. Remember the network of 34, I think there's at least six other programs working on this. So really working to develop this network of the food from the sea career um, network. So Alexis, I'm going to show you a film, a, a, a very quick video that talks about that first, com the commercial fishing apprenticeship program. There you go. Okay. Commercially successful. I told for Apple. Six, 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 I have a son, son, son. Luke is 30 years old. Five, 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 five. He started diving with me a few years ago. He was out to get into the fishery. He tried for eight years to get into the fishery. And I said, what plan? He does it exist for his father, son, and for his profession. We're designing a commercial fishing apprenticeship program in collaboration with the fishermen of California who have asked I think the, the apprenticeship is really important so that we can responsibly grow the industry. That's it. See, we have to It's time to sit down and, and, and hand down the, uh, the love of the love. One of the things that's really special about fishermen is for keeping an eye on the outcomes every day. Um, and they not only bring back yeah, that's not too good.
And we will have an hour for lunch. And so when that happens, we will try to get the video up and going and we'll loop it. So after you're done eating, if you want to come in, you can have a chance to watch the video at that time. Thank you. Can I just get rid of it? Okay, so we, now the sound, <laughs> I broke it, sorry. Hmm. So the, the apprenticeship program, I want to tell you, was designed you to meet um, statewide. Can I get this slide? So the training topics that are going to be covered are so the examples are based on the pilot that ran. So it had the pilot had five apprentices, and the the topics that are included are fisheries, um, science, policy, and practice, boat and gear competency, business and marketing, as well as safety and seamanship. So I want to let you know that we will be developing it to include aquaculture. So the target are entry level crew and staff. So the requirements are listed here, um, 18 and older, veteran fisherman sponsor, high school degree, swim test, um, scuba certification for dive fishery, physician certificate so they can participate, and then observer on um, fishing trips. So the goal of the training is really a skilled workforce that is safe, responsive, responsible, collaborative, and invested. And they have an idea about the path to career growth. So that's the, the goal. Format is our interactive workshops, so about 100 hours of both online and interactive training done over two to three weeks. And then the, the important part that allows that apprenticeship part is the on-the-job training under veteran fishermen. Um, again, the experience for 1,000 hours um, gained over 6 to 12 months. So again, they are being paid during this time. So the interactive workshops are coordinated by California Sea Grant staff and led by our staff with several groups. So for this uh, meeting, I want to think about and have us think about who are the lo logical other partners, because the intent of this is to adapt based to the regions, right? Not just in San Diego. So what does Fort Bragg need? And then it's bound by an agreement so that there is no grade. So we want to make sure that they're willing and they're committed to this. And there are fees, but the 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 pilot ran with scholarships, so scholarships as available. And then the goal is to teach concepts and activities that supplement that on the job training and build camaraderie. So again, list of the main topics. And then this is an example from the fishing. So the science and policy of life in the sea, right? Learning about some bi marine biology, fishery science, and then science and policy of life on the sea, fishing history, what it takes to be a fisherman, and then being an engaged fisherman, stewardship and sustainability, involvement in the community, and information that allows them to contribute to data collection and con contributing to management. And then there's the seafood marketing and business end, teach the steps of development and implementation and operation of fishing and seafood marketing business. So those are the topics that were covered. And then also there's the safety and seamanship that was done both interactive through the Mariners First Aid CPR AED, as well as the AMC Coast Guard accepted drill conductor training and then the boating skills. And, I, and the last one was an online training, the clean boating training that's provided. So the on the job training requires one to two fishermen mentor for per apprentice and it's bound by a crew member contract and then again earn while learning. So the goal of that part is to teach practices needed to safely prepare for and complete fishing trips and the cell catch. So this list, I'm going to quickly run through the slides. So the fishermen trainers are given a checklist and we are trusting that they will cover these topics as they um, work with this, um, the apprentices, safety gear, skills to prevent and minimize, respond to accidents and emergencies, the vessel stability and emergency response, seamanship and navigation. So boat and gear maintenance is also um, taught. Fishery science and conservation practice. This is the checklist that we're given to um, the fishermen trainers. So the manual that has all this information is going to be available, is already available online, and I'll put the URL. And then the seafood business and marketing. This is the checklist to cover those topics. 
And then after completion, they would get a certificate, uh, right? Acknowledging that they're on the job workshop, workshop hours and also the competencies. It really is our intent to have this recognized through the state as well as nationally. So the pilot revealed some needs, right? This expansion and desire to spread throughout California. Could a training program work here? And then links again to the other partners and other programs that needed to successfully, successfully implement at the different sites or harbors. And then incentives for participation for both trainers and trainees. Could be an integration into the permitting policy or scholarships and sponsorship. And then there was also a need for experiences up below or younger than 18 and then also um, early career training. And then there's also challenges. I can't end this slide without challenges, right? So there's a lack of veteran fishermen willing to sponsor apprenticeship. I think that is going to be a key challenge given this type of program. And then you saw the checklist. It's, un, it's hard to know if they've covered all that, right? So there is this uncertainty of about the effectiveness of that, that part, right? And then the pairing of the commercial fishermen sponsors and apprentices is so key to having this work, so that's not so easy as well. And then probably the most important is like, are there going to be jobs for these apprentices to take once they finish? So that is with that, just thank you so much for your time. And then please do reach out. The, the pilot program manuals are all on, available online. And then the pictured here is Teresa to the left and Carrie to the right. And the, I think those are the three of the five apprentices. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. And I really do apologize to Shauna. This is an incredible program and I think it has a lot of potential up here. And I'm really looking forward to learning more about how we can all work together. We have, this is what we were having such a great conversation about in our calls, because this is an incredible mm -hmm. opportunity for us to help develop that workforce that we need. We at the Noyo Center need for what we wanna do in the future and also what we need as a community to build more opportunities for our kids who can't necessarily go to four year universities, but we could, could, we could supply um, an, an avenue for some good STEM related jobs, help our fishing community. I think this has a lot of potential and I look forward to working more with everybody on. Um, yeah, that one, yeah, thanks. So, Anyway, I'm here to talk really quickly, and I'm sorry again about the speed, but I'm going to go through these fast um, about the Noyo Center. But for many of you who don't know us, because we've been working here kind of stealthily for so long, and I know a lot of you are from other regions in the state, I wanted to give a quick overview about what we do. Um, our mission is to advance ocean conservation through education, experience, exploration, and experience. Um, but I want to step back for a second and think about what how we even uh, originated in the city when we first when the mill first closed in 2002 the city took uh, the opportunity to to do a community visioning process uh, what does this this community had their entire waterfront to plan what do you want to see and this idea of a marine science center came up strong in every meeting and the city engaged in an extensive feasibility study to see if that was even possible here and what would that look like. They then bought property. We own 12 acres out on the mill site, which is even more valuable now than it was back then. Um, and they did the initial design concepts for what a center could look like. So the city took this as their first blue economy initiative and they launched the nonprofit in 2015. They hired me to launch this nonprofit and why marine science here why do we decide it was a good idea um, we wanted to connect our community to the coastline our community was literally built with their back to the water because the mill was here so now we've literally opened the gates and we want people to understand what um, are the resources off their coastline we wanted to sort of fill this research desert as we started to call it between bodega and humble what's we had this incredibly productive coastline what do we know about it uh, we want to showcase sustainable development on the mill site. We have 420 acres that's going to be developed one day. What does that look like? How can we do better? What? How many communities have their entire waterfront to plan? Uh, we want to help the community move from this extractive um, economy to a more sustainable economy, which I think we heard about last night in the fishing panel. Um, and then experiment with restoration techniques. How do you turn a former industrial mill site into a healthy coastline? So there was lots of reasons for doing this when we looked at the feasibility of it. And then at the same time, 
we start we we got a crash course in in bulk help. Um, I think we heard a lot about this, so I'm not going to talk much about these about these slides. But this was what sort of came. We had a very small staff in 2015 was when we incorporated as a nonprofit. So we we were created because we had this incredibly productive coastline, and we immediately saw a change, a flip in that. And how does this organization, so young and so new, meet that challenge? So we worked together with a collaborative team, many of you here in the room, to really address what do we know? What do we need to know? How do we even begin? What do we do in a community that is so remote? And you know, we are a community that will come together in a crisis. And so just real briefly, you know, we began working with some of our partners and a lot of the folks up here to, to organize the fishermen to start pulling urchin out of the environment. Could we see an expansion of existing bulk help beds by doing that? So for two years, we the Noyo Center organized that. We um, brought out 45 metric tons of urchin. Um, we put together a citizen science team that went and met every single one of them on the dock, Bob gave us space on his docks to do this, as did Pacific Rim, over 225 volunteer hours every year doing that um, data collection. We got underwater to see what was happening and show people, like we have two climate change stories here in Mendocino County. It's really easy to relate to the forest fires that we feel every, every fall. How do we get people to relate to what's happening to our kelp forest? So we actually took if you, I welcome you all to go across the street to the Discovery Center. We took over one of these vacant storefronts. We built a geodesic dome so we could give people that experience of getting underwater and seeing what's happening to our habitats and seeing the science that's going on to try to address this crisis. Um, and we went into the classrooms. And then this is Kelp Forest is what we've built over there. And I hope you go see it. Um, we're part of the walking tour tonight. So please come to our reception. We also worked with a, a, a team, including UC Davis and Urchinomics and the Nature Conservancy on some trials. What are the aquaculture, what is the aquaculture potential if you're taking a starving worthless urchin out of the environment? What can you make out of that? And we did these trials at Bodega. Noyo Center helped work on the collection and transportation protocols for that. Um, and we had some successful trials. But the story still remains grim and there's a lot of research going on and we still need so much to do. How can we as a young organization continue to contribute to this? Um, this, is a, this is a graph that shows, you know, the, the, although we have very variable kelp because we have an annual species, we're still seeing a pretty straight line. So we, we've been looking for a place in the harbor for quite some time. And we finally found what I think is a really wonderful spot for us in, in North Harbor. Um, again, it's open tomorrow. We're having a little open house from, from 9 to 12 uh, on North Harbor Drive. You'll see our signs. It's, it's a, a small space that has that boat access. It's not meant to be a big research facility, but really give us that access to the water. We will start some of our research down there. We'll provide experiential education. We'll provide more internship opportunities. We'll provide more opportunities to work with fishermen and hopefully interns. Um, further our collaborative work with some of our partners on this on this ecosystem issue and address some of the river and estuary health with Anna and other members in the harbor. Like what is our heart, what does our estuary look like? Because I'm so tired of the nonprofit model of fundraising, we're also going to open the Slack Tide Cafe at the space. This was a this was a commercial restaurant, the, the building we bought. Um, we want to use this restaurant, this, this commercial kitchen to support our mission, but also to make some money to support our research. Um, so we will be working on um, creating the right balance between that business and how much research we can do down there. We want to build it into, we want to build our mission into the business. We'll recycle our plastics and use them um, at the facility. Maybe we'll turn them into 3D filament for our 3D printers. We'll use the commercial kitchen for urgin tasting events like that so we can continue to um, market what could be a new fishery here. Um, we want to use that facility to start a red oak abalone um, broodstock program. And I look forward to talking to more of you about that. We're looking at funding sources right now. Davis is um, a partner because they've been doing a lot of the white abalone broodstock and we want to do the same thing here so we can make sure that reds and maybe pintos even 
um, are being collected. Uh, we're working right now with, um, you know, the sunflower sea star, which is our predator, is still pretty much vacant from the environment. Um, we have exciting two, two sightings off our coast recently, so we're starting a new citizen science program with uh, the Nature Conservancy to start going out on those super low tide events and seeing if we can find any juvenile sea stars. Um, we're excited about that. The community is super excited to get involved again in that. And how can we address purple urchin? How can we use that facility to do that? We want to put in a couple of raceways or some sort of urchin aquaculture down there so we can continue to prove the concept that you can have a clean aquaculture facility on land, that you can take an empty ur urchin and turn it into a delicious seafood product. We want to market locally so we can get restaurants to be using them. We can get people to see how delicious they are. We want to be part of that that process that really makes people understand that our contribution to the habitat is through restorative seafood like this. So we've been working with partners, as I already mentioned, including the Harbor House, which is our two-star Michelin restaurant in Elk now, um, to continue to help us develop some really tasty options for that. And then, of course, the vision is for the Ocean Science Center out on the headlands. We have the 12 acres, as I mentioned. We now have new conceptual plans. Um, for a really innovative um, zero energy building that will need a workforce to help sustain it. Any of you that live here that have solar on your house, you realize how hard it is to get people here that have those green technology skills. We want to be working with the Mendo College and West right now on how do we build a, a workforce that can help our community move more towards green energy. Um, this is, I'm going to go through these really quickly. I'll give us a, a talk about the Ocean Science Center at another time, but it's got, right now the design is for a very minimal research um, space, but we have a lot of space out there. So we're hoping we can continue to move forward with some aquaculture um, op opportunities out on the headlands. Of course, we want to have the beautiful kelp tanks so we could show people what, even though this has macrocystis in this, because I know you guys all can tell the difference, our architects cannot. <laughs> um, we have some beautiful skeletons, including a 73 foot blue whale skeleton. Um, we want to showcase that. We don't have any place to put that until we get the center built. This is a, an actual 3D for all you tech geeks out there. We 3D um, scanned every bone and we can digitally articulate our skeleton now. Um, and this is what it would look like to really give that beautiful experience when you're walking on the coastline and, and have a beautiful place to come in and, uh, and learn about our coastal habitats. So for us, next steps is to continue that design. We're working with West on exactly what um, we're talking about here. How do we create a regional blue economy strategy? How do we fit into it? Kashaya tribe will be talking later. We really wanna talk to them about that regional strategy, for instance, and what they're doing. Um, create a business plan for our building that is building in all of these things that we're talking about, job training, entrepreneurship, pilot projects. How can we use, we can build that research facility to be as big as we want if we have the need. Um, so how can we do that and to stimulate a workforce, particularly on aquaculture, because so far we're still the only predator in the environment. Um, I can't read my slides because of the things, but <laughs> sure there's a lot of important information under there. <laughs> but educate, of course, we wanna to continue to educate. We wanna build up our research capacity in the harbor. That's what that's, that's saying with, with some of the things I've already talked about. So just a quick note on our significant happenings of the week. We've made the news all over the place just to let you know some of the other things that we do constantly. We're out there. Um, re uh, responding to all of the dead marine mammals so we can see what's happening to the species out there as well as the health of our oceans. We have just this week, because of these incredible winds, a beaked whale come up on shore, which is extremely rare, a 16 foot beaked whale, which we still haven't identified to species, they're so rare. Um, we're working with uh, researchers in Poland to try to help identify that. And we brought some samples down the marine mammal centers to do some genetic analysis on that. We've had a striped dolphin come up, four Guadalupe fur seals. They're all in an unusual mortality event right now on the coast. So there's a lot of science going on here. I hope that I can tell you more about it another time when we have a little bit more time, but I know we all wanna get on with the rest of the program. So thank you so much for... Uh...
more technological difficulties today and more gracefulness. Thank you, especially Shauna, thank you for just rolling with that. And thank you, Sheila, for speaking very quickly so that we could continue on with the day. That was fantastic. Uh, so um, good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah McCormick, and it's my honor right now to introduce you all to our California State Controller, Betty Yee. I asked the, um, her staff to put a little something together for me because I would just be like fangirl up here and say all kinds of goofy stuff. So uh, just to let you all know, uh, Controller was elected in November 2014 following two terms on the Board of Equalization where she continues to serve as a voting member. Re-elected in 2018, Yee is the 10th woman elected to statewide office in California history. As chief fiscal officer of the world's fifth largest economy, Yi chairs finance tax board and serves on the California public employees retirement system and California state teachers retirement system boards. Yi serves on dozens of boards, commissions and financing authorities affecting the policies from land management and affordable housing to crime victim compensation and educational facilities. As chair of the state lands commission, she stewards public trust lands and waters. You led adoption of the commission's first strategic plan, focusing on sea level rise and oil decommissioning with a commitment to environmental justice and tribal consultation. She spearheaded shuttering the last state oil platform in the Santa Barbara Channel. A native of San Francisco, he has more than 35 years of experience in public service, specializing in finance and tax policy. He leads a team of professionals responsible for financial reporting, audits, and issuing more than 49 million payments a year. Through the pandemic, she has worked to reimagine the state controller's office as a workplace of the future. Controller Yi previously served as chief deputy director for budget with the Department of Finance and in senior positions for several legislative committees. Yi serves, serves on the board of Ceres, a global nonprofit organization mobilizing investors to advance sustainability and address climate change. And we're honored to have you here in Fort Bragg. We welcome you and please welcome. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Good morning, everyone. I first want to say how excited I am to be here uh, on this beautiful day in Fort Bragg and with so many leaders uh, who are really putting their stake in the ground here to reimagine an economy and an economic future that I think really holds so much promise. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, I also will say uh, when I got the invitation uh, a year ago, and I'm sorry that we could not convene last year. Um, I just wanted to jump at the opportunity. You know, I serve in my role as controller of the state with uh, always a lens to the economy, but I also know that what fuels that economy is what happens in our local regions throughout the state. So what I wanted to do this morning is actually just talk about uh, some of the work that I've been doing, but also my perspective about the blue economy uh, that um, I will say has had um, a lot of twists and turns uh, over the last almost eight years that I've served on the State Lands Commission. Uh, but uh, first, let me just say to the city of Fort Bragg, uh, many of our elected leaders are here. Um, you see their commitment uh, in terms of this work that all of you are doing and to California Sea Grant. Um, we talk about partnerships a lot. This is an important partnership and I uh, just wanna thank uh, both of those uh, entities uh, very much. Then to all of you, I mean, all of you are leaders in your own right because you're here. You're spending your time on a Friday, fr frankly, over the, the, these four days to really come and learn, uh, to come and listen. And as I think about my role at the state level, I wish we could do a better job of that as the state of California. And uh, I say that with fondness for the work that I do, but also uh, seeing that we miss a lot of opportunities when we don't do that uh, as well. So uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, Sarah. And uh, you know, as I think about being the CFO of the fifth largest economy, it's, uh, it, it is a daunting task on the one hand. On the other hand, I know that what it means is that uh, all of us have to be a part of this economy. 
uh, and how we continue to, to grow it and to thrive uh, in this economy. And so I'm actually here without my green eye shade today, uh, because what I want to do is, that, is talk about uh, just some of the important work that we have done. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I am on the boards of the two largest public pension funds. So sustainability has become a very, very critical factor with respect to where we put our pension investments. Uh, and I will say that the divestment movement, yes, certainly um, moved us there a little bit uh, more quickly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also want to be sure that where we are putting our assets to work is supporting the work like all of you are doing here. And so this is going to be a long-term journey. We look at the long-term horizon in terms of how we invest our assets to be able to pay the retirement benefits of our public sector workers and educators. And it is work that I'm proud to do, uh, but it's also work that's very, very difficult because we are global investors. Uh, and so what I like to think about here and what we do in California is being witnessed by everyone across the globe, uh, but at the same time having tremendous impact here locally. Uh, this year, and in all even number of years, uh, I do serve as chair of the State Lands Commission, and it is uh, of all the commissions I serve, I actually have a seat on over 72 commissions and boards, not all active at the same time, but um, this, I have to say, is uh, one of the most uh, impactful uh, roles in which I serve. Uh, in the years that I do serve on the State Lands Commission as chair, I also serve on the Ocean Protection Council and the California Coastal Commission as well. So a quick update in terms of what the commission has been working on. Um, uh, all of you know that the uh, Coastal Commission authorized um, uh, BOEM to move forward with the lease sale of the wind energy um, uh, area offshore Humboldt Bay after a public uh, comment period this, um, this summer. So this will be the first offshore wind project on the US West Coast. And uh, I'll just talk about the blue economy and how it relates to Humboldt Bay in a moment. Uh, the Ocean Protection Council, thank you to California Sea Grant and to so many of our partners uh, were enlisting commercial fishermen to remove the kelp eating purple urchins that you've been uh, talking about at two sites in Mendocino County. Uh, and the project really did um, culminate, I think, because of the engagement by local stakeholders um, hardest hit by the kelp forest collapse. And so uh, it's already a model for how we do community-based restoration. And uh, so no reinvention in terms of uh, how we uh, bring the community together on that. Uh, investing in six um, innovative um, solutions-oriented research projects to better understand the drivers of kelp declines and also the effectiveness of various restoration approaches. Um, in uh, terms of kelp restoration efforts by recreational divers, we are there on the North Coast and also in the Monterey region as well. And so uh, just looking really up and down the coast for those opportunities. And then developing an action plan that um, is focused on proactive climate-ready management of kelp forests and supporting the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in developing the long-term kelp restoration and management plan. And so today what I wanted to do was also give you some updates about just the state of the state, because I think when we do this work, um, it's important to have the backdrop of just what is happening in terms of the state in general. Um, all of you have spoken and I know are focused about, you know, how do you bring uh, the human capital and the talent, uh, sustained talent, uh, to uh, lift up the blue economy here in this region. And I'll just talk about nationally what's been happening. So we have saw, uh, we're seeing employment continue to rise uh, in the country, um, over 400,000 jobs in April. A national unemployment rate stands at 3.6%. Um, by way of context, um, at the height of the pandemic, it was at 14.7%. And so uh, employment is uh, definitely uh, recovering. Um, I'll talk about the type of employment in a moment. Uh, so there are some positive developments, and even as we're sitting here uh, with worries about inflation, uh, that uh, we're seeing still a real GDP growth um, it, that, that took place in 2021 by about 5.7%. It was recently announced that uh, GDP fell at 1.4% uh, uh, in the first months of 2022. And we do think that that will be uh, somewhat protracted, a lot of it uh, driven by the supply chain uh, constraints that we are seeing uh, globally. And we also are anticipating that with the dip in uh, many of our federal stimulus programs, our federal COVID uh, aid uh, programs, that we also will uh, begin to see, um, and we already are seeing, rising interest rates to try to quell some of the, the demand for uh, goods and services. And um, as we think about inflation, this is definitely top of mind for everyone. You know, we can be on this trajectory to do this great work. And uh, of course, when we're met with increased costs, um, it's always uh, a, a bit of a worry about how long that will last, uh, what it will mean in terms of people making major changes in their lives, uh, to look at the potential of being a part of this community, to do the great work that you're all doing. 
you know, by measure of California, we are looking at um, unemployment, uh, which uh, fell to about 4.9% in March uh, from about 5.3% in February. Clearly, California was con and continues to be a driver of the national job growth. And uh, for context, the uh, California unemployment rate at the height of the pandemic was about 15.5%. So jobs are getting created. So why are we still seeing uh, labor shortages in so many of our sectors? And I think this really is the issue about um, the work that you're all doing, and that is uh, how do we uh, really understand what's been happening in terms of the great resignation and people leaving the workforce, um, the demand for um, skills that uh, many of our workers still are not prepared to uh, take on uh, in jobs. And so those are uh, many of the challenges that, that we are facing. Uh, our GDP growth uh, was about 7.8% in 2021. And um, I'm pleased to report that our fiscal condition is actually in pretty good shape. Um, so we have, as someone said, Lots of money, <laughs> lots of cash. Uh, so please, 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 as I think of all of you coming together as a community, I, I mean, if I were on the side of reviewing grant applications, I would be thrilled to look at an application from this region because of the partnerships that you all are, have developed and will continue to develop. Uh, so state revenues continue to come in uh, beyond projections and uh, the governor did revise his budget uh, projection upward uh, in uh, last week when he announced the uh, revision, his annual revision to, to the budget. Uh, we also know that, uh, however, that we are meeting what we call our state appropriations limit. And I'm just gonna get a little wonky for a minute because this actually matters. Uh, all of you remember, or some of you who are native Californians will remember Prop 13 in 1978. A companion piece to that was establishing a state appropriations limit, which bench uh, spending at that level uh, grown forward by CPI. And if we reach that limit, uh, the uh, excess, if you will, uh, revenue uh, has to be either placed in reserves, uh, be expended for uh, public education or for infrastructure. And the governor has done all of those things in the revised uh, version of the budget. Uh, and why this matters is because uh, if we are not going to do that, uh, for every dollar that comes in, uh, it actually will be subject to one of those types of expenditures. And, and uh, we actually will see the value of each budget dollar um, dropping because uh, uh, as we are um, really reaching those limits with respect to what we can spend, um, we are probably going to see uh, many parts, uh, many other parts of the budget affected in terms of, you know, just the uh, reduced spending that would need to happen to be able to fund those three purposes for the excess revenue coming in for the state appropriations limit. So what does this mean for the blue economy sector? Um, I don't think I need to tell everyone in this room about how vital this sector is to our economy. It's a $145 billion sector of the economy. Uh, it supports uh, over um, half a million jobs. It generates about 21 billion in annual wages. And so to localize that figure, um, it accounts for about 93 million of economic activity here in Mendocino County and about 3.5% of the county's GDP. And so as we look at the 1100 miles of the Pacific coast, uh, it contributes immensely to our economy. Um, prior to the pandemic, really uh, mostly through tourism and recreation, and uh, which accounted for about 77% of the employment within the blue economy. That has changed, that has changed. And as um, California CFO, I, I always do wear my accounting hat. And so uh, as I think about just um, what this means for, for our communities as our economy uh, takes a different kind of complexion, change is going to mean probably, and it's already I think is uh, being felt here, um, less revenue. Uh, it will mean that uh, how do we look at uh, more uh, sustained um, economic activity that can uh, stabilize uh, the revenue situation here. And for an area of the state that is so blessed with um, natural beauty and the resources, um, I think all of you recognize, and we need to better recognize as a state, that uh, environmental and economic considerations go hand in hand. And this is not to say that one exploits the other, but that it means that they go hand in hand, that there can be economic growth and at the same time, uh, responsible economic uh, stewardship. So um, I, just want to say to all of you, thank you for being in this space. Thank you for not giving up on the hard work that this is going to take to actually lift up the blue economy. And thank you for being a part of this region where I know change has, uh, as you heard from Shauna, as you heard from Sheila, 
uh, Marianne, um, change has necessarily taken place, particularly as it relates to the effects of the pandemic. But I know that um, here on the Yo-Yo Bay, um, you know, obviously just considering all the different possibilities, and I think this is really what is so exciting about the work that we're doing. We're both optimistic and aspirational at the same time, but sanguine about how difficult this is going to be. And I know that also when we talk about the blue economy here in California, it means a lot of different things. It means a lot of different things. And I, and I think we may have even representatives um, from the Port of San Diego here, or from San Diego, but in terms of what the blue economy means for San Diego, a lot of it really based on um, just uh, technology and, and uh, looking at uh, you know, maritime. You know, to look at it up in Humboldt Bay, where yes, we are looking at it from a perspective of providing additional um, you know, energy, renewable energy, but, and then the Monterey Bay uh, research really anchoring a lot of the activities down there, but all with the promise of what the aquaculture industry can bring. And so very happy that you're spending a lot of time on that issue. But one of the things that I hope that you don't forget as you're thinking about doing this work, <clears throat> in addition to the attributes of this beautiful region of the state is that you have a history and you have a culture. And the history here is one where uh, it's not any different from any part of the state, but it is a unique history here. And that is really the fact that we are uh, actually sitting on the lands that once belonged to our native and indigenous communities. And I think to be able to have this opportunity to lift up uh, the blue economy and to be able to return back to the wisdom and the experiences of those communities and how sustainability really played a significant part about how we're able to live together with the land is really important. It is also a time where, and I know this is a learning festival as well, which I really applaud because we don't have all the answers. And uh, one of the great things about crisis is that um, opportunities do come. I won't say that the power outage was a crisis yesterday, but uh, certainly a lot of opportunities came out of that in terms of your ability to just have conversations, to share experiences, to share, uh, possibilities to think about uh, where are those state funds that could actually come to this region and to have this, uh, the, the city manager's office already you know, onto that. So we have a great deal to learn from individual communities that are facing a variety of challenges. And um, I will say that one of the things about the blue economy that I have really come to recognize is that it's getting more prominence, it's getting more attention because it's the next new frontier. And I say that with a little bit of uh, trepidation because oftentimes we look for easy answers to solutions. And when we are challenged with respect to what our lands can offer, we now are looking to our waters. And I hope that uh, when we think about an economy, that we are really thinking about it really with respect to just what we all, I think, subscribe to as the goals of a blue economy. And that is to really look at how we do uh, sustainable economic development and also protecting the precious ocean ecosystems and their health. And the state, I will say, has to do better about that. Um, and I really see this from my point of view as the CFO and making all the payments for California to the various programs that all of you are hopefully going to be uh, beneficiaries of. And that is, we don't really account for uh, how much progress we're making. Lots of dollars, zero measurements or very little measurement. So we have to do better so that we can know how we can manage going forward. There's a saying that you can't uh, manage what you can't measure, what you don't measure. And that is something that I hope we can do a better job of at the state level. And this is where I think regions like Fort Bragg are gonna do a better job. Many of you have been working under limited resources for a very, very long time. And frankly, haven't had a relationship with the state of California um, that's been sustained for a very, very long time. And so as you do this work, as the state becomes an even greater partner with all of you, I hope that you will insist on metrics that really start to begin to help us think about the progress that we're making uh, going forward. It's also difficult to, um, particularly for under-resourced communities, to even um, keep track of what's available to you. And I just want to offer my office as a resource. Um, some of you know Christina Kunkel, who was a former Sea Grant Fellow, who was now my Deputy Controller for Environmental Policy. Uh, we are happy to be a resource to you. There is a lot of funding in the budget. And my, uh, frankly, my biggest frustration is that a lot of it isn't coordinated. 
development, which is why I want to just uh, speak about a bill that we are sponsoring. It's Senate Bill 1123 by Senator Caballero. And, um, you know, the state is providing billions of dollars in funding to support communities adapting to the changing climate. And it's not simply enough to just appropriate the funding, but we need to ensure that they get to those communities and businesses best positioned to make a difference. And so, uh, like I said, it can be very difficult for under-resourced communities to access these funds. And so uh, what I try to do with this bill is to look at bridging this gap. So this legislation would connect communities and individuals with what we call resilience navigators at the state, identifying available resources and uh, providing contacts at the implementing agency for each of these programs. And so, uh, but a big piece of this is also ensuring transparency and accountability for all of the climate resilience funding uh, to allow anyone to track where the funds are being spent, how well they're addressing critical needs, and also how we can improve programs over time. So uh, this is really uh, something that I care deeply about. Um, I, I'm, I will tell you my orientation as a CFO and in, in public finance, since I've been doing this work for well over 35 years, is I operate under the assumption that we are always um, living and working in a time of finite resources. Because at any given point in time, those resources may not be there. And so whether it's our uh, physical capital, whether it's our financial capital, um, I always just assume that, uh, and frankly, do our best work and are most innovative when we think about those resources being constrained. Uh, but what I am most excited about with respect to the conversation that all of you are having, uh, with respect to what you're trying to do here in the Fort Bragg region, is that you really are trying to harness your human capital. And that capital is endless. And I hope that all of you recognize that and really do put uh, a lot of attention uh, to some of the points that certainly uh, Shauna and Marianne and, and Sheila were talking about. Uh, that is going to define your future. And I think as long as we are attracting talent here that continues to have those who are participating be part of the civic discourse and the engagement about what this future looks like in this region, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. So as I said, when I first was invited to the symposium, uh, I accepted it with excitement because um, I wanted to learn more about what is happening here relative to the uh, blue economy. Uh, this is a smaller venue and region than uh, San Diego, obviously, um, Monterey. Um, Humboldt to the north, maybe a little bit, um, but I, I'm seeing some synergies with respect to Humboldt probably being uh, appended to uh, some of the, the efforts here. But, um, you know, all, all of this work uh, in terms of um, building a robust blue economy uh, with the common goal of sustainable economic growth and protecting our ocean ecosystem health, um, I just want to submit to you that there's a greater challenge than just meeting those goals. And the greater challenge is um, how do we look at, um, you know, really um, more reliance in terms of our waters for the challenges that we're currently facing um, as we have more demands on our waters for food, uh, for energy, for potable water, uh, even for basic economic vitality to meet basic needs like housing and jobs. And I would also submit to you that um, this small region of Fort Bragg, um, you may not be well, resources, well resourced in terms of a tax base, but you are well resourced in terms of the might of all of you. Uh, this is, uh, I traveled the state extensively, and I will say that, um, you know, areas that are well resourced um, don't necessarily think about just on the ground concerns about how to create change. All of you have had to do that because that's been your history uh, in terms of relying on each other to make things happen. And so when we think of an economy, and I, and I like to think about this because, um, you know, I think when people think about a blue economy, it's like the next, the next segment of what we're gonna uh, look at in terms of um, how we look at production, how we look at consumption, how we look at the trade of, of, of uh, goods and services like any other economy. But I think we have a tremendous opportunity here because it is about much more than that. In fact, I would say, I hope it's just not about that. Um, the production and consumption of goods and services um, has to fulfill the needs of those uh, living and working with this, this economy right here in this region. And yes, it is about livelihoods and it is about jobs, but it's also about how we um, work smarter 
with the scarce resources that we have. And uh, also how we look at um, not just economic growth, and not just sustainable growth, but inclusive growth, inclusive growth. In other words, um, uplifting an economy must not rely on the exploitation of our communities or our resources as we have witnessed so many other economies have. And this I think is important because um, we can continue to move on. We will continue to be creative about how we solve to the problem of the day. But if we continue to carry historic inequities forward, how far have we really progressed? How far have we really progressed? And so I leave you with this. Um, we have a tremendous opportunity here in Fort Bragg to demonstrate what a successful blue economy looks like. And uh, you, you're, as I said, your tax base may be small, but I'm confident that uh, if you accept this greater challenge, that um, you will all be successful and thrive. Because this is not an afterthought. This is not a one-off. This is not the next logical step to take. It has to be integrated in everything that you are doing and in your thinking about how to move forward. And I've often thought about um, you know, just kind of what we're calling the blue economy as calling it something else. Because I don't like the idea that we're going back to kind of the old rules and norms about how to build an economy. And so I've been thinking a lot about how about calling it a blue re-economy, re a blue re-economy. You know, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to do here? We are trying to uh, really look at how we can move to a future that is renewable, that is restorative, that is resilient, that is regenerative, and reimagine with respect to our ocean ecosystem health. And I, always, I will also add to that, we're looking to a return. We're looking to a return of a time when it worked that we could live sustainability, uh, sustainably and compatibly with our lands and waters. And so when I mentioned earlier, the return to the wisdom experiences of our native and indigenous, indigenous communities, this is a tremendous opportunity to be sure that that is part of how we uh, make sure that our movement here is inclusive. As I said earlier, many times uh, in the day, I think about as your CFO of California, I look at most issues through the lens of the economy. Uh, and I often reflect upon just what the um, origin of the word economy is. And it is a Greek origin and the origin of the word economy Oikos, meaning home, and uh, Naaman, meaning manage. It's about managing our home, about managing our home. And so I would just say to all of you, let us continue to manage our common home here in California, here in this region. And let us reach to make shared prosperity a reality in building this economy here in Fort Bragg. It is possible. We talked about uh, the, the possibilities. Uh, I just can't say enough about how thrilled I am to be here. Um, certainly as a member of the State Lands Commission was very involved with the blue economy development in San Diego. And this has such a different complexion, such a different complexion. And I'm almost chilled to speak about it because I just see the possibility really becoming reality here. And what I'm gonna ask all of you to do is as we, you engage your partners, as you engage your partners, keep that civic engagement and discourse elevated. This is not about something that, um, as I said, is meant to be exploitative. It is about how we build this together. And I will, um, I will say that as I, my term ends at the end of this year, um, I am gonna to continue to be in the space about how we build economies that are sustainable. Uh, California has a lot to offer, and we are viewed across the globe as where innovation happens. And so uh, I really do believe innovation happens in these spaces where there isn't necessarily a lot of resources, but where you're going to grow your own resources and how we're going to have the potential, the potential of really creating and managing this home that can be where so many more can continue to live and thrive. And so I want to just say congratulations to all of you for the work you have done. And uh, obviously, we'll continue to be very interested in the work that you will continue to do together. 
And I hope that as we all continue this work together, that we not forget what I think will be one of the most important lessons of the pandemic that I hope gets written in our history books as we look back to this time. And that is that each of us is essential to the other. Each of us is essential to the other. Marianne spoke about in her presentation. And whether it's from the very, very micro level of just checking in on your neighbor to say, how you doing? To looking at how we are lifting up our entrepreneurs, those who, are, who may have lost livelihoods, but certainly our new entrepreneurs that we're welcoming here. And to uh, really look at a future that is about how we build this together. Again, each of us is essential to the other. And I hope you carry that forward as you continue this great work of building this blue economy here in Fort Bragg. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for that, um, State Controller Yi. That was uh, that was very informative and uplifting, and it's great. Great to hear we have a lot of money. Um, my name's Luke Gardner. I'm a uh, extension specialist for California Sea Grant. And when Sarah first reached out to us uh, nearly a year ago about um, trying to trying to put this symposium on and the help, um, both Kevin and I, Kevin Johnson, also a California Sea Grant extension specialist, jumped at the possibility. This is definitely the kind of work we like to do. Um, and so in saying that, what we've got going for you is um, a series of uh, presentations from uh, presenters that very generously gave their time to, to come up here and, and give you a flavor of what aquaculture is. And so we're going to start off with some, um, some basic presentations about kind of aquaculture generally, and then we're going to get into um, some conversations about conservation aquaculture as well as commercial aquaculture. And so I'd like to say that to start off with, um, the train has definitely not left the station. This is just the start of the conversation. And the point of these presentations here is to really uh, act as a resource, not to uh, be prescriptive or tell you what you should or shouldn't do here in Fort Bragg, but just to really give you a flavor of what aquaculture is in the state um, and what it potentially could be. And so in the interest of time, I think we'll, uh, we'll jump straight into it. And so our first speaker is Randy Lovell. He's um, with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and he's our state aquaculture coordinator. He's gonna give you a, uh, a 101 in California aquaculture. Randy. Thank you, Luke. And thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate being here. As Luke mentioned, I'm gonna be introducing some uh, pretty basic concepts in aquaculture. So I wanna apologize up front for those of you who have experience um, with some of the basic terminology. Um, we're gonna cover a little history and put it into some California context um, just as soon as we have a, have a good look here. Just this screen is fine. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So, although it's not really strictly aquaculture, um, it really all got started with salt. Um, the harvest of salt by the area's native people was observed by early Spanish explorers around San Francisco Bay. Gold rush immigrants later began engineering ponds to, uh, to fill and drain with the tides and have been exploiting the work of a tiny brine shrimp to help keep salt crystallization orderly. Um, you probably can't see everything here, but um, the magic of these shrimp is that as the brine concentrates 
due to evaporation and temperatures fluctuate, it needs to be kept mixed and raked to prevent the crystals, the wrong crystals from forming prematurely. This might otherwise be a very labor intensive process were it not for these tiny brine shrimp whose fluttering legs keep the brine up in suspension. Um, huge blooms of both Artemia and the Donnelliella algae that they feed on gives the bricks a red color that's visible for miles. Brine shrimp, which you may know from your comic book days as sea monkeys are extremely important in aquaculture. They provide fish and shrimp farmers with larval diets for their hatchery operations. So key animal. Uh, and then there were oysters on the menu here in California for thousands of years. Archaeological shell mounds can be found up and down the coast. Uh oh, help. <laughs> sorry, folks, <laughs> and sorry I'm reading, but uh, I, I I really want to stick with the time constraint here. So, uh, before before statehood or since early statehood, California has been planting and rearing oysters intentionally, making them our true first aquaculture species. Today's aquaculture or shellfish aquaculture industry contributes about twenty five million dollars to the state economy locally or annually, and constitutes just about all of our current marine aquaculture activity, at least up to now. Oyster, oyster culture started with native oysters. Uh, however, to supplement the native oysters that were by the mid 19th century being cleaned out of the bay, uh, more were brought from Puget Sound on a regular basis and that created a thriving oyster trade at both ends of the journey. Uh, when the Gold Rush Barbary coasters wanted even bigger oysters like they were used to back east, they tried everything to haul them west, first in barrels on board ships around the Horn, which didn't work. And although you can't see the picture, um, they were loaded onto trains and barrels, and it was only after the Transcontinental Railroad was completed that it finally succeeded. So uh, I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. I want to make sure we're on the same term uh, page on terms. Aquaculture we can define as the farming of aquatic organisms, no matter whether they're uh, fish or plant or algae. Mariculture is simply aquaculture that's done in salt water. Polyculture would be uh, producing species, more than one species in the same space. Hydroponics would be not really considered aquaculture, but it is raising plants without soil and often uh, in a purely aquatic medium. And so when we combine aquaculture with hydroponics, we call it aquaponics, uh, a very quickly growing in popularity activity. California aquaculture is really defined by its diversity and adversity and how the growers have responded to challenges. It's practiced in nearly every habitat the state has to offer from deserts, mountains, valleys, cities, and the coast, and in nearly every county of the state. They raise a huge variety of species using many innovative techniques. Also, it's a situation where the water availability is never a given. Growers have adapted and founded ways to reuse or recirculate and or conjunctively share water after use on the farm, such as with uh, neighbors who irrigate or the habitat that's dependent on that water. Aquaculture is done commercially and as a hobby and for a variety of other beneficial purposes, including conservation. Those producers who survived and thrived have done so by recognizing niche opportunities within the strict regulatory environment and expensive costs of operating that we have here in California. Examples of the variety you're gonna see more of from the producers who follow today. Um, but the diversity of markets that are, are served by our industry here in California range from seafood itself, uh, fish that are used to stock uh, or enhance for angling and other purpose, conservation purposes, 
Uh, there are applications in pharma and specialized nutrients, pets, research, and more. As a whole, the industry estimates the economic value at about $200 million a year. Um, I'm gonna take us on a little exercise. Um, please take it to heart as you consider this question that's gonna get asked repetitively in different ways. So why do aquaculture? The first way we might break that down is in the context of comparing to other food producing alternatives uh, and the justifications that motivate us to do aquaculture. Uh, feed conversion ratio is the efficiency at which feed is converted into meat. Uh, aquaculture is at the top of that because we're generally talking about cold blooded animals who don't need to maintain body temperature. And they're also not fighting gravity. So energy use is much lower. So the conversion of feed is extremely efficient. Another reason to do aquaculture has to do with reducing the reliance on wild caught harvests as our population grows in the world. Controlling the environment that you raise those animals or plants in is also a huge advantage, whether you're talking about the water or other kinds of uh, uh, applicants or therapeutics you might need to utilize. Uh, the nutrition can be controlled and optimized depending on what the market needs are, what the animals needs are. And it's very important to think about some of the other alternative ways we might produce protein or food in comparison. Uh, and the use of land is a big one. Uh, because we're talking about a three-dimensional space, it can utilize a much smaller footprint. Uh, the use of water especially marine aquaculture is extremely low compared to most other crops. And the emission or the um, impact on greenhouse gas emissions is also quite low. You can't see from the slide, but this is um, supported or presented by studies from UC Santa Barbara's Brin School, Dr. Steve Gaines um, publication. So another way to think about why do we do aquaculture has more to do with the markets that are fulfilled or the applications for the product. Again, food is one, pets and companionship animals are another, enhancement or restoration, another, uh, nutrients and pharmaceuticals I just mentioned. Research may seem like a nebulous term, but uh, this little animal, this zebra fish, uh, has an incredible level of understanding by folks that do developmental biology and genetics research. And I can't go into the detail, but it's just pretty fascinating what we're learning uh, about the, the whole organism, uh, uh, organismal biology because of this animal. animal. Uh, and of course, we've all heard about the potential for biofuels and other things from algae. Uh, we're starting to hear much more about polymers and plastic packaging being replaced with sea seaweed origin materials. So pretty exciting. Um, one more time, why do aquaculture? This one now, I'm asking in the context of your planning in this particular location. And so this is the plural you. Why do you, why would you want to do aquaculture? You, it might be as simple as uh, making a living and or having a job. It might have to do with investor return. It might have to do with more philanthropic needs or educational motivations, building a local economy. These are all um, obviously legitimate rationales for getting into aquaculture. And depending on which of the kinds of markets that you're serving, the rules and the regulations that apply and not just regulatory rules, but the rules of the economy uh, are, are perhaps gonna be quite different. So it's, it's really important to stand back from that term aquaculture and really ask what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, there's been a fair amount of discussion about some use of terms that I, I think it's really important to think about. Sustainability being one of them. What do we really mean when we talk about something being sustainable? Are we talking about the product? Are we talking about a local economy or a local enterprise? Are we talking about a global economy these are important questions to ask as you throw around that term. It's not that it's exclusive one way or the other. It applies in different ways at different times. Sustainability context, we can also talk about externalities. And the question 
at the basis or the foundation of externalities has to do with who profits and who pays. Uh, and we can ask that question in the context of environmental uh, payment or economic payment or profit. So I think it's really important, and you can't really see it here in the picture because it's at the bottom, but if we restrict what happens in our own backyard and squeeze the regulatory cinches, the balloon is just going to squeeze out behind between your fingers and the activity is going to move overseas or to some other location where it's more friendly. Um, what about that lax environmental oversight that would happen elsewhere, the lost local economic opportunity and the carbon costs of buying plane tickets for our fresh seafood? These are all perhaps obvious things. They've been brought up in talks before, but we've learned a lot lately about supply chain disruptions. And although seafood doesn't really uh, make the same headlines as, as some of the other disruptions like computer chips um, and the ripple effect that that's had, it's still a very, very important factor. So um, sustainability is not just about impacts, but it also infers resiliency, especially amid changes. Um, what is your reference if you talk about resiliency? Is it at the enterprise level? Is it at the industry level? Is it a policy level? Ask this of those who will probably advise you as you move forward in your plans here. Those of you in the room and those that are listening are going to have different roles in this process and you might have different views on how to interpret terms like sustainability and resiliency in both environmental and economic terms or context and in both the short term and the long term. Resilience can also be talked about or discussed in context of risk. Um, we can analyze risk and we might even be able to manage risk and we can divide it into those that are more obvious and those that are maybe not so obvious. Um, you're gonna be hearing from speakers today and I would ask that you maybe consider this second list of not so obvious risks. Um, ask what are those pinch points? What are the cost centers? What are the metrics for success? What are the threats to success? Things like competition, errors and omissions, legal challenges, environmental changes, regulatory changes. There's a whole lot more things to consider. From an economic development policy perspective, it's real tempting for us to focus on the global scale um, we think about world population and its explosive growth. We might think about uh, increased middle class effluence and the effect that affluence and the effect that has on the demand for higher quality proteins. Um, and we also think about um, the, the extent to which what wild caught seafood can supply the demand of this growing population and where aquaculture is, is uh, trying to fulfill that gap. Um, but I want to take us through a little bit of a thought experiment here, just in the state, um, and relate it to what our seafood demand is. So we're roughly 40 million people in the state. And although this number on the slide, I just learned the other day is erroneous. It's, it's down by about four pounds, but this is, this math is a little bit easier. If we multiply 40 million pounds, 40 million people, by 15 pounds of seafood consumed per person per day or per year, 40 times 15 is 600 million pounds a year of seafood consumed each year by Californians. About half of that is supplied by commercial fishery landings or at least half of that amount is caught in commercial fishing land each year. The, uh, the nutrition of authorities are telling us to eat more seafood because it's good for us. And so the bottom line behind the, behind the caption here is that our demand for seafood far exceeds our supply. So we have a lot of methods, we have plenty of rationale, many market demands, and a lot of it met by foreign competition. So why not here? Our potential to grow aquaculture in California is significant, but then so are the challenges. As you've heard and will probably continue to hear throughout the day, 
Aquaculture permitting is a bit like running a gauntlet. There's a lot of different agencies involved. I won't explain the, each of the roles here, uh, but it is my job as state aquaculture coordinator to help you navigate that process. Um, also, there are a lot of different statutory acts, codes, regulations, most of which had nothing to do with aquaculture, but we are still compelled to comply because they do have a nexus. So um, it, is, it is tough to navigate through this process. And like I say, that is my job and you are not alone in, in seeking remedy and solutions. One of the goals of the federal uh, NOAA policy with regard to aquaculture has to do with improving regulatory efficiency. Our state policies reflect a similar sentiment uh, calling for support and improved um, efficiency, both in our public resources code and in fish and game code. And development was called for by the California shellfish industry through an initiative. Uh, it asked also for added space and improved regulatory efficiency. This California shellfish initiative was actually supported and received unanimous bicameral support by the California legislature, by the way. Um, so improved permitting um, has also been a recurring theme at the federal level and uh, is supported, has been declared on a, on a bipartisan basis too. So translating that action or translating that challenge into action, taken some creativity in the era of CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act and also the, uh, that of the digital age. Uh, we, we have a lot of counties that have adopted virtual permit counters. Uh, they use, are used to submit materials online for everything from adding on a room to building a new house to what have you. Because of the complexity of aquaculture permitting, uh, we've needed a much more interactive approach. And so we took a, a cue from the governor's office of business and economic development, who suggested, why don't you consider one of these virtual permit counters? So we did that. And we now have an aquaculture permit counter where applicants can engage in early consultation with regulators before they invest too far along in that process. Uh, it gives uh, everyone a chance to uh, raise red flags, avoid surprises, and refine business plans before official permit applications are made. So uh, a new applicant or someone who's interested would contact our office and we would try to figure out how well developed the idea is. And if it's really ready for prime time and bona fide, we would organize a project coordination team from various agencies who you will have to engage with at one point down the line anyway. Uh, we also have uh, a reference tool for permitting, uh, connecting to each of the agencies and their information. Uh, and I really wanna salute those of you here who organized this event and, and the guests that you have invited to speak already. The real creativity comes from people like you that envision ways to combine your interests and your resources and your group projects and efforts together and drive the efficiencies and synergies that come from that. As you know, you have partners throughout the state uh, that you can learn from and collaborate with. And these partner or port district partners have invested uh, heavily in their unique assets and capabilities. I feel a little redundant uh, based on what we've been hearing, but there's other things to consider uh, with your counterparts as you move ahead and, and maybe think about some tools. And I don't have a slide that lists these things, but I, uh, some of the themes that are, are really starting to take hold, I think, are, are items like programmatic permitting, shared services cooperatives, uh, revolving funds. With, and this is a concept that is used in drinking water, uh, federal appropriation money put into a state fund, state water board now manages it. Uh, to help smaller water districts supply what they need, whether it's new infrastructure, distribution, storage, what have you, uh, various assets that need to go through CEQA. Uh, they don't have the resources and, and funds to necessarily do it out of cash. 
but a revolving fund can not only help them get through CEQA, but can amortize and spread the recoup of payments from their ratepayers over time. And as they collect that, those payments over time, they can repay the revolving fund and those monies can get passed on to somebody else who's doing the same thing. So these um, programmatic approaches, whether it's uh, permits themselves or the environmental review that's required before that, or as you're gonna hear more about uh, the concept of aquaculture business parks, all great ideas to overcome what I, I believe is a systematic bias against small businesses and small industries like aquaculture. And these kinds of creative ideas can I think find or provide um, uh, an opportunity for equitable access or an equitable access to opportunity is another way to say it. So uh, speaking of opportunity and access and business support, incentives, training, and a variety of other resources to help um, help develop business. I wanna introduce you, if you haven't already met, uh, Ms. Ms. Manjeet McCarthy from the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. I strongly encourage you to find her, talk to her, discover the resources that are available and uh, put your heads together to find plans and resources to, to move ahead. Um, website doesn't show there, but if you look up GoBiz, you'll get to them real quick. That's all I've got. Um, thanks for having me. And if you'd like to contact me, I'm, I'm available. Thanks for that, Randy. Um, next up on the agenda, we have um, Greg Baba. He's from, he's the executive director at uh, the Hawaii Ocean Science and Technology Park. And among other things, um, that includes a, uh, an aquaculture park. And so it's a, I asked Greg to speak today to give us a sense of what an aquaculture park might look like elsewhere. So without further ado, um, of course, Greg is from Hawaii and understandably he couldn't make it out here for this event, but he's joining us via Zoom. So Greg, if you're there, um, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, um, Luke. Uh, I assume you can see my screen um, and you can hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I had a chance to view a couple of presentations, very good. And, uh, and uh, I thought Randy's uh, overview was uh, very good. Um, let me just take a few minutes to kind of give you a, a brief uh, background of what we do here. Uh, we are a state agency, we're part of the state's economic development group, and we're in, in West Hawaii, uh, in Kona, and uh, we have a 900-acre uh, technology park, ocean science and technology park, and we also have a six-square-mile research corridor offshore. And um, we, we focus on uh, developing the blue economy in Hawaii. We, we're 45 years old. We, we started in, in the 80s. And uh, we're here because we have access to uh, pristine deep sea water immediately. Uh, the shelf drops off here very quickly. Uh, here's a kind of an image of, of the, the businesses here. And uh, we're adjacent to the airport. And uh, we're actually starting to run out of land now. We have about 250 acres left that's uh, readily available. And um, here's a kind of an image of the, the sea, deep sea water pipelines that we have offshore. Uh, they go down to uh, 3,000 feet. Uh, we pump uh, about 1 billion gallons with a B per month. Uh, to the businesses here on shore. Uh, we pump uh, both deep sea water, uh, which is cold, it's uh, 41 degrees, and surface seawater. So those are the deep sea water pipelines and we have surface seawater pipelines in, in the same intake areas. Um, and uh, businesses here, about 55, 55 businesses right now. Here's another image of our seawater system. I think it's the most uh, 
extensive uh, and has the biggest capacity in the world. And we, we pump water 24 seven, uh, pretty much uh, constant all the time. And um, uh, the uh, important point is, and I had to chuckle a little bit when Randy talked about how difficult permitting is in California. I, I would encourage you to come to Hawaii and see see how really difficult it is. Uh, I think our permitting system is, is really even more stringent because because uh, uh, we're so remote. Um, but uh, we I think uh, one of the important takeaways is that we have been successful because we are pre-permitted. So this technology part we can bring businesses in very quickly. Uh, we dispose of the water on shore. We're not allowed to dispose of the water uh, uh, after the people use it uh, offshore. Um, so we've done two EISs over the years and uh, everything is adequate for us to dispose of the water on shore. One of the reasons we can on shore is because we're on lava that is only 200 years old. So as soon as you put the seawater uh, on the lava, it, it pretty much disappears. There's no soil here. Uh, it's all fresh lava. Um, but we, one of the important parts, I mean, we're here because, you know, we're remote, where biosecurity is very important for us. Uh, there are no diseases here, which is important for aquaculture. And uh, we make sure that this water stays some of the most pristine water in the world by having a sampling program. We sample 120 sites every 90 days. We've been doing that for uh, almost 30 years now. And we have oh, both onshore and offshore, and we haven't seen any uh, change in the water quality. Uh, and that's very important for us because uh, that's our livelihood it is the pristine water. So. Uh, being pre-permitted is, is very important, both from a land use standpoint and an environmental standpoint. So uh, we can bring companies in here and get them up very quickly. Uh, here's an image of some of the companies here. Purple is aquaculture, uh, and um, uh, orange is, is the land that we have available left. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have a list of the companies here. Uh, we have uh, a research campus, the green at the bottom of the screen. It's about six acres, uh, and we are going to expand into the area area 17. If you can see that, uh, we're just starting to develop those plans to expand into that area because right now we're 100% full in the research campus. We have about 25 businesses here. We have no more office space and and no more space for outside space. Uh, for businesses to come in. So that's that's really important for us. Um, here's kind of just an idea of an illustration of where we are probably halfway through our build out. Uh, and I, I would tell you, uh, if you're going to start doing this, uh, be patient. It takes a while. Uh, you know, this is this is 40 years and we're probably halfway. It takes a while to put everything in place. And uh, now we're focusing more on aquaculture. We did a big pivot a couple of years ago before we used to focus on energy, but we decided we have a big comparative advantage in aquaculture and uh, probably will be at full build out uh, in, in about uh, 15 years or so. Um, I said we did do an aquaculture initiative a couple of years ago. I think it was four years ago. Uh, you know, we noticed a lot of the things that Randy was talking about, the global demand for aquaculture is growing. You, you're seeing federal recognition now of the opportunities. You see a lot of venture money moving into this area. Uh, we, we are uh, successful in aquaculture over the years. Uh, uh, SPF uh, pathogen-free shrimp was invented here a long time ago. And uh, we produce about half of the world's shrimp root stock now that are shipped to Asia for grow up. Uh, but we, because of that, we have a lot of mentors here. And for startup uh, companies, 
Uh, that's very important. Uh, we did hire Hatch. Uh, they were based in Norway uh, to run our aquaculture accelerator. Uh, happy to report that uh, we just got another uh, EDA, Economic Development Administration grant to extend that for another four years and Hatch has announced they're moving their headquarters from Norway to here in Kona. Um, this is an important slide because we've had success in aquaculture and that's what we call food security. And right now we're going to try to expand that into ocean technology, energy security, and ocean conservation, which is what we consider the major clusters where we have a comparative advantage uh, in the blue economy. And we would like to start two new accelerators, one in ocean technology and one in ocean conservation. Uh, ocean conservation is really growing rapidly. Uh, people are investing a lot of money and trying to find ways to, uh, you know, uh, mitigate the impacts of climate change. And uh, we're seeing a lot of that activity here now. Um, here's our research campus. It's master permitted. We can bring people in within a couple of weeks because everything is ready. We have office. We used to have office space. Uh, we have uh, deep sea water. Uh, available uh, and surface seawater available, fresh water and power for some people uh, lease about um, uh, the minimum is 200 square feet. Uh, we charge 25 cents a square foot here. We charge 220 a month. Uh, we charge 225 uh, a month for uh, office space. Uh, we charge 20 cents uh, per thousand gallons for seawater. And that is uh, our business model uh, is very unusual. We're a state agency, but we receive no money from the state government. So we are a self-sufficient agency. We generate all of our own revenue. We generate about five and a half million dollars a year. Half of the money that we receive is from those leases and half of the money is from the sale of seawater to the businesses. It's important to point out that the, the uh, seawater system is run on a break-even basis, and that's a benefit for the businesses here, and that's how we attract them. So whatever it costs us to pump seawater is what we charge for it. And like I said, it's 20 cents a thousand gallons. Uh, leases for aquaculture leases are $500 uh, per acre per month. Uh, and we also charge a percentage of of gross receipts, uh, which is uh, two and a half percent of gross receipts. Some of the businesses are more retail, and uh, we charge up to five percent of gross receipts for, for those businesses. Um, here's our office incubator that's currently full. It's about 20,000 square feet. It was really when we renovated this building, it used to be a warehouse. When we renovated this building, about six years ago, it really made a difference. We could bring businesses in here quickly, and uh, it really helped us fill up our research campus. Our new research campus, we're in the process of building this new building, uh, 10,000 square feet of office space and 10,000 square feet of wet lab space. That's very important uh, to have an area where the seawater is in the building and researchers can do their research. Uh, I'll kind of finish up with economic impact. Uh, University of Hawaii does this study for us. The most recent one is uh, over $100 million in, in total economic impact, um, about a little over 500 jobs. We do generate $5 million in state tax revenues. And uh, in the past seven years, we've attracted 51 businesses and uh, we do rely on federal and uh, foreign grants. We've got about $14 million um, over, the, over the past uh, seven years. And kind of one last thing is that, you know, we're finding that developing pathways for uh, uh, our younger children here is very important and ensuring that there's a properly trained workforce uh, that is causing a bit of a problem. So and it takes a long time. And so I would encourage you to consider developing 
uh, pathways or training in place. It used to be called workforce development a long time ago, but uh, those are uh, those are kind of some of my uh, summary comments. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that, Greg. We really appreciate it. Um, in the interest of time, we could maybe take a handful of questions, but we are pushing up on lunch here. Does anyone have a question for Greg? Greg, the question is, how did it get started? You're referencing the, yeah. It, what was the, yeah, what, what was the main push for it all to get started? Nelhar and- Yeah. Hawaii. Interesting. That's a good question because we're called the Natural Energy Lab and we don't really do energy. So in uh, actually it was the oil crisis in the 70s and the state wanted to, uh, you know, find ways to uh, reduce our, uh, our uh, reliance on petroleum. So they started the Natural Energy Lab and the, the pipeline system was developed to produce ocean thermal energy conversion, OTEC. And uh, we also, at that time, we also had a project on the other side of the island uh, for uh, geothermal energy. And the geothermal energy project was successful and we were able to uh, demonstrate the viability of that. And now the private sector, we turned that over to the private sector and about one third of our power is from, from geothermal. So we don't, we don't do that anymore. And OTEC is still, um, you know, I, I would say OTEC is similar to um, the uh, hydrogen economy. It, it's a ways out there, uh, and uh, but it still has a lot of potential because you're using the sun's surface as the solar collector and using warm and cold water to generate power. And uh, but that's why the uh, we have this extensive seawater system. Uh, and the idea was always with OTEC is you generate power and then you reuse the water for aquaculture again. But that was the idea. The state and federal government have invested about $100 million in this system. One thing I do want to mention before I leave, uh, I was talking with Luke and, you know, it's important that, uh, you know, companies consider the value of, of uh, tourism uh, and generating revenue. Uh, the Oceanic Institute here on uh, Oahu uh, was started in the 60s, and, and I think they're uh, a force to be reckoned with worldwide in terms of aquaculture research. They've done a lot. That's really where SPF Shrimp was started. But they developed, uh, you know, Sea Life Park next to it where they use the water, and Sea Life Park is a major visitor attraction. But the idea was to use tourism and generate the revenue from visitors to fund the research. So it's not something that is kind of backwards because some of the businesses here, they do research, they do aquaculture, their farms, but then on a the side, they do, um, you know, visitor tours to generate more money. But some of the newer companies have, have used research to generate money I'm sorry, use visitor uh, um, visitor arrivals or visitor tours to generate money to do the research. So they're doing it backwards. And so I think that's something you consider. And I think that um, from a tourism standpoint, uh, you know, people find it very rewarding, you know, farm tourism. Uh, it's not your typical tourism, but, uh, you know, some of the businesses here do over seven figures a year in, uh, in uh, tours and they're very very popular thank you for that greg okay um again greg thank you for uh, joining us um and i'm sure if anyone in the audience has questions we'll be happy to relay to them but in the interest of time we're pushing up against lunch here i would okay. like to thank you thanks greg thank you. So yeah, the, our next speaker is um, Severino Gomes from the uh, Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians. And he's gonna give you a taste of what the, um, the tribe has been up to in terms of uh, aquaculture and um, how they're kind of thinking about very similar things to what Port Bragg is. So thanks Severino.
So I just came. Yes. Which one? Of the Okay. Um, yeah, hello, my name is Sabrina Gomes. I'm uh, currently the uh, chairman of the Economic uh, Development Committee for the Band of uh, Palm Indians, Kashaya. And uh, I'm basically just going to, uh, a lot of this material has been covered by a lot of other people, so I'm going to. Uh, just cover uh, Kashaya, what we're up to. So we uh, we decided to actually get involved in this. Uh, God, it's been quite a few years, but I'm gonna go back to uh, uh, 2017. Uh, well, actually 2015, we acquired some land. We reacquired some land that we lost, you know, over the years. Uh, uh, we actually what we wanted to do was get access back to the ocean to get back to our regular resources that we lost over the years so we actually we did that and then all this other stuff started happening and they closed the abalone uh they closed access to the abalone so we uh uh that kind of just stopped us right in our tracks so uh, uh when i talked to the community they said well we thought we were going to get access back to the abalone again well that ain't going to happen so we decided just to, we, that's when we decided to do the abalone farm. So we got a, we got a hundred percent backing from, oh yeah. Did I touch something? Okay. Anyway, so uh, we just, we just sort of, we, it made a lot of sense for us to, to uh, build an abalone farm. Let me get back in there. I'm probably not going to use this anyway because I'm just basically talking about what we're up to. A lot of this stuff's been covered already. Um, anyway, so so it made a lot of sense for us to uh, do a uh, do an amelone farm since we lost all you know we lost uh, access to this uh, resource. But then you know it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. You know I I, don't, I have no background in biology or any of this stuff. So we just we started reaching out to a lot of the experts. You know, actually, uh, Fred Carr uh, is our is our tribal attorney, and actually, he had background in biology, so he was actually the first person that I started working with. And uh, so then we just from there on we started reaching out to the scientific community, uh, to the state, and whoever we can find to kind of educate us on how do we go about this. You, you know, just because you want to do something, you know, it's it's not that easy. I come to find out. So we've been working at this for at least five years uh and we're so we we're pretty much done with the due diligence you know so we're right now we're in the uh pre-planning and pre-development you know i don't even know if we're halfway here yet but so what we actually basically what we came out what we came out with was this is this is going to be a challenge and we need to work with a lot of people in order to get this done you know, we have the land, we have nothing on that land. It's bare land. So we'll be starting from the beginning, you know, so we've been talking to engineers, we're talking to everyone. Uh, and uh, so, so basically that's about where we're at. You know, there's not a whole lot to, too much to report on that right now, but you can go over this material. It's pretty much the same stuff that you heard already, but uh, I'm gonna end it here because I don't have too much more to say about that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Severino. Um, if anyone has any questions for Severino, you, we're happy to kind of answer them now, otherwise we can wait. Um, but I think that brings us up to uh, lunch. So is Sarah around? Okay, so I think we do have boxed lunches for everybody out there, courtesy of um, Fort Bragg and Sea Grant. Um, we're, go for it. 
So thank you for the morning session. This has been fantastic. What we have set up for you is a box lunch outside and blankets. So if you'd like to grab a blanket and join us out on the guest um, facing west into the very sunny, very rewarding and very comfortable. So thank you all for speaking this morning and listening. And just a quick plug, please join us back at 1 p.m. We have um, Congressman Huffman giving some remarks.
Alright, oh my pleasure. It's a pleasure. Okay, it looks like we're ready. Um, I am not Bernie Norvell, the mayor. <laughs> I'm Tess Alban Smith. I'm a council uh, person on um, this Fort Bragg City Council. Um, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor has a new grandchild, so he couldn't come. And he, I'm so I'm yeah. sure that it was a hard decision on his part not to come. But anyway, we were going to introduce um, our congressman. Uh, Representative Jared Huffman, uh, but uh, since I don't have a script, we put it up on Zoom. <laughs> and without further ado, and I wish there was a band and a red carpet, yeah. I bring you Mr. Huffman. All right. Thank you, Tess. I am going to just create a little space there, hopefully without breaking anything. Did I just disconnect them? Yes. Uh-oh. Well, I heard the power's been out here for two days as well, so. Uh, yeah, that's what, that's what we do. Okay, we're back, and I'm going to try not to touch anything. Uh, I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. It's really a, a great honor to be here. Let me start by thanking uh, the city and California Sea Grant for partnering with the Noyo Center, of course, to, uh, to make this happen. I'm hearing great things about how this conference is going. I love the fact that uh, people from all over our region are gathering to talk about the blue economy, because uh, when you represent a congressional district that goes from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border and has one third of the California coast, the blue economy uh, is kind of a big, big deal. So uh, thank you for doing this. And I thought I would just, um, share a little bit about uh, some of my work in the Congress and then uh, leave, leave some time for some question and answer. Uh, but let me start with a little bit of uh, good news. We could use some of that these days. Um, the good news is that after many, many years uh, in this last Congress, despite all of our problems, uh, we were able to bring something back uh, that used to be called earmarks. And now we call it uh, community projects. And it's really th the best of what earmarks have always been, which is actually members of Congress who understand local priorities are elected by local communities accountable to them, having a say in some federal spending decisions as opposed to just handing large blocks of money over to the executive branch. They're a little uh, disconnected, I think, from communities and from the folks that we serve. So I think it's appropriate that members of Congress should have a say, but uh, there were some earmarks, you know, historically that probably were not as responsible and vetted as they should have been. So we've put a bunch of sideboards and safeguards in place. And I'd like to think that we have brought back the best of that type of funding uh, with some sideboards to make sure uh, that it's good stuff. And in my district, uh, in this current fiscal year, I was able to bring down $11.5 million for some really important projects. And uh, that includes climate resilience, it includes affordable housing, critical infrastructure, disaster preparedness, things that wouldn't have been funded if I didn't have the ability to just direct it to happen. And um, here in Mendocino County, I'm really pleased that the Anderson Valley Affordable Housing Initiative got $400,000. I'll be stopping by there later this afternoon to celebrate that. And uh, for those of you that care about our kelp forest, which is probably everyone in this room, uh, I was really pleased to be able to get $2 million 
for the Greater Farallon's Kelp Recovery Program. And that is gonna uh, enable, thank you. That's gonna enable some really important interventions. Uh, so very important that we continue to do the research and the community outreach that's gonna be part of recovering from this terrible kelp die off. But we're starting to figure out some things that'll actually work on the ground to bring them back. And we've just gotta fund that. So $2.5 million is gonna, is gonna help a lot. And so we're now in the appropriations cycle for the next fiscal year. And we're gonna to try to identify another set of really worthy community projects for this type of funding. Uh, and the challenge here is that I don't have infinite funding. I've only got you know, up to a max of about $15 million. And I've got six counties I represent between the Golden Gate Bridge and the Oregon border. So as you can imagine, there's just a ton of worthy projects that have come forward. In fact, we got over 80 applications and we are sorting through them right now. Uh, but you will be happy to hear that among the community projects that we're gonna be putting forward in the next fiscal year funding bill, the Noyo Center for Marine Science is on that list. And so is, uh, yeah, thanks. So is another really important affordable uh, housing project right here in this community. So stay tuned and fingers crossed that we'll be able to, again, bring uh, some large chunks of federal funding down. A little more good news. Uh, last November, President Biden signed the biggest infrastructure initiative that we've seen from the federal government in decades, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It was a bipartisan infrastructure law. And you've heard, I'm sure, about roads and bridges and you know broadband that's really important water systems all of that features very prominently in that bipartisan infrastructure law uh, but there's some good things for our coast and our oceans as well and i just wanted to flag the fact that we included 172 million dollars for pacific coastal salmon recovery through noaa's uh, recovery fund and 150 million dollars for ocean and coastal observations uh, again, under NOAA's budget. So uh, we're looking out for our oceans in every way that we possibly can. Uh, just a little bit of, of some other work that I'm doing uh, in the Congress. I'm partnering with uh, another coastal legislator, a real champion for the oceans, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. And uh, there is a reauthorization bill for the US Economic Development Administration going on. We are pushing to make sure that that includes some big things for the blue economy. Uh, so uh, we are putting forward a request that we create a $300 million special initiative for the blue economy. And this would focus on sustainable use of marine resources uh, for economic growth, increased livelihoods and jobs. It will encompass everything from tourism to, uh, marine, to maritime transport, fisheries, renewable energy, uh, and that may seem like a lot of money, $300 million, but it's important to remember that those elements of the blue economy contribute $373 billion to our nation's economy. So um, we need to pay attention and provide some care and feeding to this blue economy, and we're gonna try to do that. Uh, a few other bills that I'm working on, I've got one called the KELP Act. And uh, this was really inspired by the work that we've been doing to save our corals. Uh, you all know that we've got this horrible coral bleaching problem globally, um, but a lot of really good research is being done in Florida and elsewhere on interventions that can bring some of these corals back and, and stop the bleaching in some cases. So uh, with our kelp die off, I thought we really need something like that uh, for the West Coast. And um, so that's, that's what we've proposed. It's a, a grant program that will support both ongoing uh, research uh, outreach, but also the successful interventions that we're starting to discover. And I think we need to stand this program up because unfortunately this probably won't be the last time nature throws us a curveball and you know, crashes our kelp forests or some other part of our coastal ecosystem. I'm working on blue carbon a lot, and that is uh, an exciting aspect of the work many of you do. We're finding that these blue carbon ecosystems and I'm talking about salt marsh, eelgrass, um, coastal wetlands, uh, mangroves. They, they are wonderful, powerful sequesters of carbon, in some cases 10 times more powerful than trees on land. 
And so we've got to do a much better job protecting these habitats because we continue to lose them uh, at a scale we cannot afford, but also restoring them. And that's where you get a big twofer. When you can restore many of those types of uh, blue carbon ecosystems, you also become more resilient against sea level rise and extreme weather in coastal communities. So we've got legislation on that. I work a lot on fish and uh, salmon in particular. Uh, and I know many of you do as well. So much of our work in that space involves trying to do triage or, or even bring systems back to life that have just been terribly degraded uh, over many years by, you know, you know the litany from gold mining to dams and channelization and everything else that we have done to our salmon habitat. Uh, but there are still a few places that we haven't wrecked. Uh, there are still some salmon strongholds left in this country. Think of places like Bristol Bay in Alaska, which is the largest salmon factory in the world. Um, two thirds of the sockeye salmon in the world come from Bristol Bay. Uh, it is just a huge and productive fishery and the watershed is largely uh, pristine, uh, unspoiled. Um, they're having record years like right now, even as we you know, suffer in so many other salmon fisheries. So that's a pretty good example of a salmon stronghold that right now has no protection because you don't have Endangered Species Act listings, you don't have any of these other legal triggers that give you tools to protect them. Um, and what I would like to do is make sure as we bring these, these very damaged, degraded uh, systems back to life, as we try to recover salmon runs that are teetering on the brink of extinction using tools like the Endangered Species Act, that we not lose sight of also uh, protecting the places that are still healthy. So that's what the a, a bill I call the Salmon Fish Act would do. It would identify and kind of inventory the salmon strongholds throughout the country. I've got a few in my district. The Smith River would be a pretty good example of one. Uh, and then provide some meaningful uh, safeguards so that if anything that could degrade those habitats is proposed, there would have to be consultation, mitigation, and things like that. Um, National marine sanctuaries uh, are obviously very important to me. I'll be working on the reauthorization of that federal legislation. And we're going to try to make sure we include some provisions to improve tribal co-management and community access, as well as uh, facilitate a better nomination process so that we can have more federal marine sanctuaries. Um, we need that. And then uh, any of you who care about marine fisheries, the big federal law that we have is the Magnuson-Stevens Act. We've gone 15 years without reauthorizing it. Uh, it used to be a very bipartisan proposition, the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Uh, and yet in recent years, like just about everything else you can think of, it kind of became a, a hostage to partisan agendas and we fought about it and each side would propose bills that the other side wouldn't accept. So I, I've tried over the last three or four years to try to reset that process. I did a national listening tour. I literally went to every region where we have uh, Pacific, uh, where we have uh, federal uh, marine fishery councils under the Magnuson Act, listened to stakeholders from all different perspectives, met with my colleagues across the aisle. In a few cases, they joined me at these listening sessions. And we've just tried to uh, put a very good process in place that was really transparent and inclusive. When we came up with our draft of the reauthorization, we shared it with everyone. This didn't want in, anyone to think this was a backroom deal. And this may sound like just the obvious way you should make legislation, but <laughs> almost nobody does it these days. Uh, they usually just cut deals in back rooms where there's winners and losers and then try to jam it. Um, and I really wanted to take a different path. So it's, it's paid off. I mean, we've gotten a lot of good feedback on our Magnuson reauthorization bill. And in fact, um, I had a meeting with Don Young, who is my colleague, was my colleague from Alaska, one of the original authors of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And after a lot of work and just literally years of trying to work out our differences, I had a handshake agreement with Don to join me on this bill. And it would have move forward in a bipartisan way. And then three days later, he died. So that's thrown a curveball into my plans for that bill. We're going to keep finding ways to push it forward, hopefully in a bipartisan spirit. But it is a big deal. And it's going to take a law that has been really a huge part of 
uh, sustainable fisheries in this country. We have the most sustainably managed fisheries probably in the world because of the Magnuson Act. And it's going to modernize it uh, because climate uh, is not something that was on uh, anyone's mind when this bill was last reauthorized, but everywhere we've went in our uh, listening tour, we heard concerns about what climate is doing to shifting fish stocks to habitat loss and all kinds of things. So we're going to call for climate ready fisheries. We're going to improve uh, the fishery disaster process. Um, and I don't know if there are any salmon fishermen in this room, but when we have a fishery disaster, uh, it's, it's real easy to declare it but it sometimes takes years to get any disaster funding to the fishermen and to the other folks that are part of the, uh, the fishing economy. And they don't have piles of cash laying around to you know, weather that kind of storm. So they end up selling their boats and uh, it, it just sets a, a whole terrible sequence of events in motion. We're gonna find ways to move that relief money during disasters out to fishermen and others much, much faster. And then science uh, is the one thing everybody agrees on. Uh, if we are going to sustainably manage our fisheries going forward, especially in the face of climate change, that we're gonna have to adequately fund uh, the science and the technology uh, that are critical for that happening. I'll just mention um, a couple of last things and then I'll open it up to your questions. Um, a really important priority for me in this Congress has been tackling a problem that is rampant in international fisheries. It is what we call IUU fishing, uh, illegal, unauthorized, and uh, unregulated fishing. And these foreign fleets engage in terrible, unscrupulous practices on the high seas. Uh, they're using equipment and practices that are you know, really destructive for the environment. But there's also a forced labor and human rights side of it. They're often you know, conscripting people into working on these boats where they're out at sea for sometimes years at a time. Uh, the abuses are really awful. It's, it's slavery, basically, on the high seas for some of these countries. And um, I, I, the bad news for all of you, uh, we import a, a huge percentage of our seafood. I think it's about 40%. We're one of the world's largest seafood importers. And you don't know where a lot of that seafood comes from. Sometimes you don't even know what it is, and sometimes it's misrepresented uh, as to what it is. We've just got lousy transparency and traceability when it comes to our seafood supply chain. So I've been pushing legislation that would kind of tackle all of these problems together, everything from the bad actors on the high seas and the human rights abuses and environmental uh, abuses, uh, but also the, the trans, uh, transparency and traceability and accountability and labeling and everything else. If we can do all of these things, uh, it's not only going to make a difference for our oceans and our fisheries, but it'll level the playing field for American fishermen because they do uh, act at a very high standard. We hold them to a very high standard, and yet they've got to compete with you know, all of these bad actors, and that's just not fair. Uh, last thing I'll mention, you know, in the context of protecting our oceans and having healthy oceans and coastal communities. Um, we never want to see offshore drilling, obviously, here on the West Coast or, you know, frankly, uh, anywhere else, in my opinion. So I have been leading the charge in the Congress ever since I got there to permanently ban offshore drilling on the West Coast. I've uh, become allies with uh, colleagues that want to do it on the Atlantic Coast as well, because they're under threat. Uh, and we have uh, every year been uh, growing our ranks. Uh, I now have pretty good bipartisan support for permanent um, bans on new offshore drilling in every place but the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, we've been passing that out of the House the last couple of Congresses. We're going to continue to do it. Um, you may have heard of this bill called the Build Back Better Act that is sitting on Joe Manchin's desk. Um, we got a couple of my provisions into that permanent ban on new offshore drilling, but also uh, protection for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, where folks are pushing really hard to open things up for oil and gas development. So that's a little bit of a flyover of some of my work. Uh, I would be delighted to take your questions, and somebody will tell me when uh, we're out of time and I need to shut up, but happy to answer your questions uh, for whatever time we have. Mm -hmm. Nothing? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, so the, the program that we have under current law is called SIMP, Seafood Import Monitoring, and then whatever the P stands for. Um, and, you know, it is a legal framework that Congress provided. Uh, how it works is largely up to NOAA fisheries. They have to designate the species that are subject to it. Uh, they have the rulemaking authority to figure out what kind of technologies, how they work with Customs and Border Patrol, you know, at, at the points of entry. Um, and the truth is, they just haven't done much with it. Uh, they've only identified a few species that are even subject to SIMP. Uh, they haven't worked very hard at putting teeth into it, uh, and it's been quite frustrating. Um, so that's why we've been pushing so hard. and. Although I love NOAA and, and the work they do, uh, when it comes to tackling this problem of um, unscrupulous actors in other countries, um, they haven't been very strong. And you know, there's been a cultural institutional resistance to doing this stuff, uh, but we're pushing. And I'm, I'm confident that even without my bill, I think NOAA is starting to get the message. Um, there has been this um, attitude in NOAA for many years that the forced labor and, and human rights aspect of this was just not in their narrow uh, jurisdiction that someone else needed to take care of. I think we've got them turned around on that now. Uh, but we really need to add a whole bunch of species to the SIMP list. It should include, you know, massive fisheries like pollock, uh, where, you know, we have just the biggest pollock fishery in the world and a huge amount of it goes over to China for reprocessing and then gets re-imported in the US. Well, while it's over in China getting uh, processed, it's getting commingled with a whole bunch of Russian pollock that uh, the Russian pollock fisheries are owned by oligarchs who are on our sanctions list. President Biden uh, signed an executive order purporting to sanction, to ban Russian seafood imports, but we have no traceability. And so what's happening right now is that you know, your, uh, your filet of fish is probably Russian pollock. And there's very little that we can do about that if we don't get serious about adding pollock to the simp list and really putting teeth into our traceability measures. And I think we're making some progress on doing that. Yeah, uh -huh, in the back. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't want to suggest that I'm exactly paralleling the programs that we have for coral, but it was sort of it, the idea came from my work in the Natural Resources Committee on those. Uh, and it just occurred to me that we, we got to do some stuff like that on kelp. And, it, you know, I, I think one of the obvious uh, parallels is just funding the research. So whether it's the Bodega Marine Lab or others of you that are doing this frontline research on how we got the kelp die off and how we can prevent it. You know, we need to get the federal funding out to that. Uh, and then as we identify the interventions, that, that's also similar to with the corals. I think it's University of Miami has figured out a few interventions with coral that are actually working. And we're starting to fund those. You know, it, we're doing the same here through the funding I got for the, um, the Fairlawns folks. Um, I think it's gonna involve harvesting urchins and doing some other things, but they're showing some success. And so, you know, we should try to scale it up and do a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah, join me in thanking uh, Congressman Huffman. And our next talk will actually be uh, teed up really well. We're gonna be hearing about some of the research on kelp that has been going on with California Sea Grant and Department of Fish and Wildlife. So I'm excited to introduce to you uh, Gina Contalini, um, who will be talking to us today about some of the work going on um, here locally and in California. Thank you for the introduction. So first I'll do a brief background, I'll be, um, give you some brief background on kelp conservation. 
Um, then I will uh, present a brief overview of kelp conservation aquaculture projects um, worldwide and in California. We're gonna fix the captions here. Thank you. Um, and then we'll do summary and have some time for questions, hopefully. Kelps are brown algae in the order Laminarielis, uh, which includes dozens of species, including those shown here. Uh, kelp can be very, very important foundation species, providing habitat for dozens of organisms, and kelp are also sometimes consumed by humans as food. Here in California, I'm sure you are all aware, uh, we have two very large kelp species. These are the canopy forming, forest forming species, bull kelp and giant kelp. Bull kelp primarily exists uh, north of San Francisco, giant kelp, kelp south, and they overlap in the central part of California. Um, these are really iconic, like I said, forest forming species, and they are extremely important for providing habitat for dozens of coastal, other coastal species, for providing fisheries, and have been used in cultural traditions for millennia. However, a recent analysis, um, unfortunately you can't see the text, I'm so sorry, uh, has shown that uh, globally more kelp habitats are declining than are increasing or staying the same. And there can be many causes for global kelp decline, including climate change, over harvesting or overfishing, or more pollution, but despite the cause, this trend is very alarming. Unfortunately, California has not been spared from global kelp declines, as many of us are aware. This figure here is showing kelp canopy area as estimated from satellite imagery um, in Northern California, north of San Francisco from 1984 through 2021. Um, and the, the lighter gray lines are showing quarterly or seasonal canopy area with the black line on top showing the annual maximum. And this is primarily bull kelp. Um, so um, in Northern California and primarily Sonoma and here in Mendocino counties, um, bull kelp canopy area has declined by over 90%. And this started in about 2014 during a multi-year marine heat wave highlighted here in pink. Um, and um, um, I just blanked on my notes. Um, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, <is it possible? laughs> Many of us are aware of this decline. Um, and I'm just gonna pull up my notes really fast. Okay. Great. All right. Oh, yes. Um, so the scale of this decline um, is concerning, but one of the most concerning aspects is its longevity. Um, so it's, it's the longest um, time period of what we've seen such low kelp. Um, this, and the scale of this decline has not been seen in central or southern California. So this is a scale of hundreds of miles. Um, but there have been smaller scale declines in um, southern regions that have also caused some concern. So in response, California's coastal managers have uh, developed recovery plans and kelp conservation projects. Uh, some of the techniques they're using for recovery are removing urchin grazers, um, precisely tracking kelp abundance and kelp conservation aquaculture. So for this presentation, I'm defining kelp conservation aquaculture as growing kelp for the purposes of kelp conservation. Um, before I dive into an overview of projects using kelp conservation aquaculture, we need to understand just a little bit about the kelp life cycle. So very generally, kelp has macroscopic and microscopic phases. The macroscopic phase is the um, the plant-like phase we typically think of when we think of kelp, uh, and it's called a sporophyte, and sporophytes produce spores, 
which begin a series of the microscopic stages, which also include gametophytes, which have male and female forms, uh, eggs and sperm, and small developing sporophytes. And when we think of kelp aquaculture, um, it often involves the microscopic stages because they're so much easier to grow and maintain. Okay, now that we are equipped to understand kelp aquaculture techniques, basically, um, we will explore some of the projects around the world. So worldwide, there have been a variety of projects um, using aquaculture techniques on a, a variety of different kelp species. Um, and they, they typically are, it, are growing these microscopic stages on some kind of transportable substrate like gravel or string or tiles, and then transferring those into the ocean. And some countries using these kind of methods include Japan, South Korea, Italy, United States, and Chile. My screen changed, but it looks fine for you. Um, one of the most common methods is called green gravel. Um, this technique was originally developed in Norway for use with sugar kelp. Uh, and what they do in green gravel is um, wild kelp uh, reproductive material is collected. Um, the spores are induced to settle and grow on gravel in a controlled setting like a tank. Um, those spores um, are encouraged to grow and fertilize until um, small sporophytes start growing. Um, close up of that is shown in the middle panel. Um, and then the gravel is transported into the ocean where it will hopefully grow into, the kelp will grow into adults um, to uh, help the natural um, kelp forest. All right, so that was worldwide. Um, now we're gonna focus really closely in on California. So I'd like to introduce you to the Kelp Recovery Research Program. This is a program co-funded by California Sea Grant and the California Ocean Protection Council in close partnership with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, th this program funds six actionable kelp, kelp recovery research projects that began in 2020. And four of those projects include kelp aquaculture, kelp conservation aquaculture methods. And so I'll describe those next. The first project I'll cover is led by Dr. Gaylord from UC Davis. And this project, they're exploring how to use green gravel with bull kelp. So um, taking reproductive material, growing small bull kelp on gravel and transporting it into the ocean in Northern California. Um, using their green gravel techniques, they have successfully grown small bull kelp in Northern California in the ocean, although the long-term survival of those bull kelp is still uncertain. Um, additionally, this group is testing some of their bull kelp that they're culturing for high temperature tolerance. Another group working on bull kelp green gravel is led by Drs. Graham and Hamilton from Moss Landing Marine Labs. Um, they're using slightly different, trying out slightly different techniques for green gravel and bull kelp. Um, but because they have a unique partnership with a commercial seaweed aquaculture company, Monterey Bay Seaweeds, who we'll hear from later today, um, they have uh, one of their biggest successes has been in actually growing bull kelp from microscopic to macroscopic phase. Um, and they've been able to get adult reproductive material um, in the aquaculture facility. And this has never been documented before, so it's very exciting. And it has some potential for genetic conservation um, because it means we could um, maintain or increase genetic diversity in bull kelp through selective breeding. However, at this stage, there's no, there are no plans for any selective breeding of bull kelp, and there still are lots of science and ethical questions that would need to be answered before anything like that is seriously considered. Third project is led by Dr. Alberto from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, also involved with bull kelp, but not green gravel, this group is developing methods to preserve and cultivate gametophytes of bull kelp in kind of like a, a living library of bull kelp gametophytes. Um, and this could be really useful because uh, these gametophytes can then be used in something like green gravel um, if other research projects uh, wanted to get some um, very quickly and easily accessible gametophytes to um, use for conservation in the ocean. 
And the last project is part of the Kelp Recovery Research Program is led by Drs. Lamb and Bracken from UC Irvine. And they are using green gravel and also experimenting with tiles, um, but with giant kelp instead of bull kelp. So they're in Southern California. And they have successfully grown giant kelp juveniles using these methods, um, sorry, in the ocean using these methods. Uh, and then a second aspect of their program is cultivating gametophytes and preserving gametophytes as well, um, but giant kelp as opposed to the other group doing bull kelp. And then lastly, um, in California, not part of the kelp recovery research program, but definitely worth mentioning, there are two projects in Humboldt Bay growing bull kelp on long lines in the Bay. Um, one of these programs is through Cal Poly Humboldt, um, which has a commercial aquaculture farm in the Bay um, that was growing red algae, but now they are expo exploring um, putting a growing bulk help. They have a, a hatchery in the marine lab uh, where they start with the microscopic stages and they outplant that to their long lines um, and have had some success. This picture on the left was taken earlier this year. And then the Nature Conservancy and Green Wave have a similar project also in Humboldt Bay, uh, which is exploring whether they can grow bull kelp for conservation and restoration benefit and the impact and cost of doing so. So in summary, um, kelp conservation aquaculture is being developed around the world. It includes methods like green gravel and using other substrates for outplanting small stages, cultivating bull kelp adults in tanks, cultivating and preserving kelp gametophytes and cultivating kelp on submerged lines. Ultimately, kelp conservation aquaculture is still a very new practice, but is developing quite rapidly as communities around the world respond to kelp decline. Thank you very much for listening. And if there's time, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, my understanding is no, the, the lines are open in the, in the bay, for example, in Humboldt Bay, um, but the bay itself is not a suitable habitat for urchins, so the urchins don't even live there and they're not an issue. Um, I, don't, I don't know for certain I'm not actually involved in that project, uh, but that's my understanding and Nora, who's coming up next, um, can tell you more uh, later if you want to chat with her. She's leading this project. One more question. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on this exact dynamic, but um, I'm guessing there's just whatever whatever is helping the kelp grow. Um, maybe there's more nutrients in the water that's just making the, the kelp boom. Um, and it's faster than the urchins can eat it. Um, that's just like a spitball guess, um, but I'm happy to engage in discussions about these dynamics with you and other folks later, if you would like. All right, next. Next, I'm really happy to be able to introduce Nora Eddy from the Nature Conservancy, who's here to talk about some of the work of conservation aquaculture that's been going on um, with sun sunflower sea stars. Um, All right, join me in welcoming Nora. Thank you. Take her tape up. Okay. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to put my notes up here because uh, or just a few thoughts because I've just so many nuggets out of the conversations that I just don't want to uh, don't want to leave some of those thoughts out. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk to you today about um, this amazing animal, the sunflower sea star, Pycnopodia helianthoides, which uh, some of you may know. It was an animal that was ubiquitous on this coast for many years. It actually was like one of the most common sea stars in this region. Um, and it's now a critically endangered species. Um, but before I jump into that, I just thought I'd introduce myself. I'm not from this area. Um, so I just wanted to say hello. Um, I work for the Nature Conservancy. For those of you who are not aware of or familiar with our organization, we're the world's largest um, conservation NGO. Uh, we're, we're traditionally a land-based conservation organization, but uh, our, our uh, chapter here in California has an, uh, has an oceans program. And that's where I work. That's where um, Tristan McHugh, who lives here in Fort Bragg, um, works. And uh, I come from a small fishing and farming community in New England. Uh, so working waterfronts and maintaining the vibrancy and relevancy of working waterfronts is near and dear to my heart. It's actually why I got into marine, uh, marine science in the first place. I started uh, long, feels like a long time ago now in, um, in marine sciences, specifically in small scale fisheries. Um, so I know kind of, I know the industry side of things when I was in my early 20s. I launched and operated a seafood company. So I know the industry from, from that side of life as well. Um, it was awesome to hear Grant talking about this perspective that he has as a legacy fisherman, as a family fisherman here in this area and, and kind of thinking about the reason that we show up to, to things like this and to do great work every day is, is not just for ourselves, right? It's for our kids and for the future generations. So I'm inspired by, um, by everyone in this room and happy to be here. So. Thanks for listening to me today. Um, you know, we've talked about this, the kind of kelp forests and what they do for us kind of generally, but I thought it would be helpful to kind of just bring it home and get excited and stoked on, on how incredible these systems are. They are more productive than their terrestrial counterparts, right? Kelp forests globally are more productive than the Amazon rainforest, right? And they're hidden out of view, but, but that's, that's incredible. They support thousands of species around the world and about a thousand here in California providing nursery grounds and home and, and um, food to some of our most iconic species. Um, so, so it's incredible. And this area is kind of ground zero, right, for the declines that we've, that we've been talking about over the past couple of days. And I know we've kind of touched on this loosely, but we haven't really talked about this, doesn't seem like this kind of like confluence of events, this perfect storm that led to what has been quantified at 96% of the bull kelp forests of Mendocino and Sonoma counties in less than a decade. That's significant, right? Like imagine if that was our Sierras where we were losing them at that rate, that would be front page news every day. Um, so we had this warm water event that we've been talking about 2014, 2015. Some of you will recall it was called the blob. Uh, sat off our coast. It was massive. Um, kelp don't like warm water. They thrive in cold, nutrient-rich water. We've got this incredible wind right now creating awesome upwelling conditions. Uh, kelp were already kind of in a weakened state. We lost uh, a bunch of sea star species, about 20-something sea star species succumbed to an outbreak of what is called sea star wasting disease. And among those were this incredible sunflower sea star. So those animals were gone from the system. Kelp was having a really bad day. And uh, the result was, or one of the contributing factors was this out, outbreak of purple urchins. I think Sheila had it on her slide, 60 times, 60 to 100 times the population of purple urchins. That's a lot of purple urchins. So that's kind of like, that's kind of what happened. Okay, some of you who spend your time underwater here know this very well, but this is what we're talking about for the people who don't put their heads in the water, right? Like this is what we're talking about. All these fish and all these invertebrates that support livelihoods in this community were gone, right? This transition from this beautiful forest to urchin barren um, is stark, right? These are like parking lots on the seafloor where these incredibly vibrant forests once were. So our work in this space um, is to 
protect and restore kelp forests here in California and develop the solutions to do that. And we're working collaboratively across California, but also around the world, right? Um, Gina was just mentioning, this is not a problem that's isolated to our coastline. We're, you're not going through this on your own. There's a lot of folks around the world. Um, so kind of the way that we're thinking about doing this, and I promise I'll talk about sea stars. I just want to kind of create the context for you as like, why the heck are you doing this to begin with? So we kind of set our, our strategy into three main bodies of work. So we want to map and monitor the kelp. We want to understand what did we lose? You know, where are the hot spots? Where are the strongholds? Um, and how do we keep a much better, how do we keep much better tabs on, on the changes in our, in our system? Uh, you might recognize this ocean hero right here, Grant Downey has been working with us closely to develop ways to reduce, reduce that purple urchin grazing pressure on kelp that's trying to grow through resetting the ecosystem and creating balance for, for kelp to come back. Um, and then Gina touched on the last one, right? This, this more active approach to restoration through kelp enhancement, kelp cultivation. Um, and so she mentioned the, um, the kelp farm and I just wanted to give a shout out. It's, it's um, a partnership between the Nature Conservancy Green Wave and also um, our friends here at Hog Island Oyster Company. So, uh, you know, this, this sunflower sea star is this incredibly, uh, it's a really big sea star for those of you who remember seeing them. It might be the largest, largest one. Um, and we knew there was this kind of precipitous decline in the population that coincided with this marine heat wave in that 2000, 2013, 2005 to 2015 um, time horizon. But we really weren't sure like exactly how bad things were. So that was kind of like first step, right? Let's get our, let's get our brains around like how bad is this? And this species ranges from Baja, California, all the way up through, through Alaska. Um, and so we got together with Oregon State University and about 52 other partner uh, organizations, including First Nations and tribal communities who had data on um, you know, the, the state of the population. And we put together this report that finally quantified how much, how much loss there really was. And we found that over 90% of the population throughout its range had been lost in, in just a very short amount of time. So what we did was we took that scientific report put it in a format that was kind of IUCN, which is an international body that kind of uh, creates awareness around species in need uh, around the world. Um, and this species was listed as critically endangered um, throughout its range. And so you'll see on this little slider, it's, um, it's like one step away from instinct, extinct in the wild. So that's, um, that's pretty heavy. So what do these animals mean for kelp forests, right? Like, why is that important to the work that we're trying to do to recover and protect kelp forests? So because, uh, because of the role that they play uh, in the kelp forest, they're, the, they're really the last urchin predator. They're the last like major predator on, on the um, kind of like on the seafloor with, within uh, kelp because otters are not um, no longer in this region, as you know. That's the last thing I'm gonna say about otters. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, recovery of this species is really key to resiliency in kelp forest ecosystems, right? You need kind of all the players within a kelp forest in order to, to see that kelp forest thrive in the future. And so we've been really focused on kind of understanding and elevating the importance of this species as a key, uh, key kelp forest predator in maintaining that balance. Um, and so we had this kind of crazy like spaghetti at the wall idea I'm, I'm not kidding it was like maybe we could start a captive breeding program for sea uh, for um for sea stars right so these are things obviously we know like this is something that we do for condors and other you know terrestrial based species that we're trying to bring back from the brink um i think kristin alcalino is going to talk to us next about um about the white abalone recovery program right but sea stars are, um, are unique in the marine recovery space in that these animals are not cultivated typically, right? They don't have a commercial value. We don't have a whole lot of know-how on, on how to get this done. So this, uh, this man who you see in this picture is Dr. Jason Hoden of uh, Friday Harbor Labs at the University of Washington. When we started kind of uh, peeling away the paint of like, how would you even begin to do this? 
it was kind of like all roads lead to Jason Hoden. He's a um, echinoderm larval biologist. I imagine there's probably three of those titles in the world, um, but Jason is apparently the best. And so we had these goals around developing this captive breeding program. First, it was like, can we do it? Um, but we really wanted to understand for the future of this species, okay, how do we even, how do we, how do we spawn them? How do we rear them in captivity? Defining the protocols to do that and then figuring out kind of, uh, you know, what is the impact of sea star wasting disease and, and kind of getting, getting better understanding of that, of that organism itself. So to date, uh, I'm happy to report that we can actually do this. We can raise these animals in captivity. Uh, we had a heck of a time finding them. We actually had to, to take our, our work to Friday Harbor Labs because there were no sea star sightings in California for a long time since that initial die off. Um, we've had several successful cohorts where we've been able to spawn them and bring them up to adulthood. Um, we've got the protocols. We've kind of like got the playbook down. Um, now we're learning about kind of the impact of warming water on the, these animals, learning about the impact of sea star wasting disease. We hypothesize that the animals that were left after sea star wasting disease came through aren't the least resilient to it. So we feel like we're starting a little bit strong with the, with the brood stock that we have today um, and just learning more about their behavior, reproduction, et cetera. So um, next steps for this captive breeding program, I will just say, you know, we've got the IUCN red listing, something that's kind of a new, uh, fairly new um, kind of like happening in this space with sunflower sea stars is that they're actually going through the Endangered Species Act listing process as of uh, last December, I think. So it's very likely that given the state of declines, we're going to see that listing go through probably uh, this coming December, and that will put the recovery of this animal in the hands of the federal government. So NOAA will be the one kind of orchestrating that. Um, and so right now, we're really thinking about how we can diversify risk. Right now, we've got all of our proverbial eggs in one basket at Friday Harbor. Um, how can we spin up a couple more facilities to kind of spread that out, to test the, the replication of those, um, of those rearing protocols, to, to do a better job of learning, making sure that we're incorporating as much genetic diversity. We found basically every sea star that exists held in captivity to date across zoos and aquariums all over the country which was a head hunt, you can imagine. Um, so understanding where all those animals came from. Um, so it's a really, it's a really, I'm biased, but it's a really interesting and exciting body of work. Um, it might actually be the last, you know, the, the hope for this species is, is this captive breeding program. Um, and so, yeah, looking to expand to new geographies and I'll kind of talk about now the, the opportunities and, and the role for, for Fort Bragg potentially in that um, with, Put, you know, with this mindset towards the potential aquaculture facilities here. So we need to uh, bring more captive breeding uh, facilities online or even just kind of like housing capacity, right? So there actually was a sea star sighting. I think um, Sheila mentioned it not too long ago in the waters of Mendocino County, right? Like how cool would that be to, to have a holding place for that animal so that we could breed or could understand a little bit more about the impact of um, sea star wasting. Um, it, it's interesting when you think about these animals actually don't like to be moved that much. So potentially proximity to restoration sites and, and outplanting sites is going to be really important for the future of, of their recovery. It makes sense to be able to do that in kind of the, the, you know, kind of the heart of where the loss has been most acute, where we're focused on our restoration efforts. Um, so I do think Fort Bragg might have a, a role to play. Obviously, that's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, but but I think that's something to be considering. Um, I think as I'm standing in this room, kind of listening to this conversation about um, restoration and aquaculture more broadly as it pertains to kelp forest restoration, but also kind of that intersection between um, working waterfronts and the need to generate and diversify revenue streams. Um, I think there's a there's a ton of opportunities here, both in both in like the human capital side of things and um, and and kind of the markets when you're talking about both the both like the traditional markets but this new kind of like restoration economy that is emerging here in California but elsewhere in the world um, 
And I do think um, I do think it's really interesting. It's not just sea stars. We talked a little bit about urchin ranching and the potential that that could have. Um, the the skill sets are are very overlapping um, with you know with people who need to be able to you know do animal husbandry and and bring these animals in from from the wild and and raise them up and then sell them into markets. They are seafood, um, kelp cultivation, kelp uh, farming is something that's used by uh, working working waterfronts in in New England. It's used in Alaska to fill gaps in uh, low revenue periods for for commercial fishermen to date. Um, so I think it's a really exciting opportunity. Um, you know, as I kind of think about wearing my marine conservation hat, and um, the congressman actually was, was just kind of talking about this with corals and then with um, you know salt marshes and and mangroves and and all of these other really important habitat forming species, right? Like we're not reading in the news that we're amassing all of these like, you know, kelp forests are cropping up all over the place and we've got more salt marsh than we know what to do with, right? Like most of these habitats are retracting and we're in a dire need to enter this new space of abundance and restoration. And that restoration effort is going to require work and investment and a workforce and know-how and skills. And I think that when I look at Fort Bragg and and just thinking about my experience and growing up in in a working waterfront that's facing similar challenges and having lived in them my whole life, um, there's just tons of opportunity to be a part of that kind of emerging restoration workforce and restoration opportunity. And I recognize that this is out of the scope of my Picnopodia talk, but um, <laughs> but I am just really excited. I think that there's a lot of opportunity here, and um, you know we've touched on a lot of it today. I think the ideas are really fantastic and. There's obviously just so much motivation and willpower in this community. So um, I think with that, I will wrap it up. And if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Dan. So the interesting thing from the science perspective is that um, there are a number of species that are typically that are urchin predators that will not eat urchins off of barrens, right? Like lobsters, which are not typically like the top of my list for the most intelligent species I can think of, won't eat them, won't eat a urchin off a of barren because there's no nutritional value. Same too for otters. Otters are very specified consumers. Um, they have no interest in eating something that has no, no nutritional value. So they're not going, they're not some like linchpin um, for, for solving our, our, our urchin problem. That's a good question. I'm sure that they do at some point in their, their life history, right? I'm sure that there's, when they're like a tiny little, um, you know, living in the water column, I'm sure that they're fish food. And um, I think when they're larger, uh, probably, probably, but I'm not sure. That's not my area of domain. I'll be out there like boxing out for them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. And the gentleman sitting in front of you had kind of a similar one. Um, the, the amazing thing about kelp forests on, in, in this part of the world um, is that we have from the Landsat satellite, we have a 40 year time series that looks across the entire stretch of the West Coast to give us like a really good sense of what is happening now and how does that look compared to what has happened in the 40 years prior, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. Kelp is an ephemeral system. We see um, you know, boom and bust cycles. But the problem and what's unique about what we've been seeing since that, that big marine heat wave 
is that we haven't seen that like return that we would have liked to see in that kind of like heartbeat model. Um, I will say that the question earlier um, that that Gina had a great answer to um, around, you know, we've seen a little bit of rebound and we have, we are seeing some canopy come back. Actually, when I came back last year, um, I was like blown away, right? Just to see kelp out there because it was gone for so long. Um, we had kind of like gangbusters um, conditions for kelp to return last year. So what you would have seen was like in, in years previous, given the oceanographic conditions, you would have seen like one of those massive peaks. But really what we saw was a fraction, about 10% of, of, what, of what it could or should have been, right? So that is an indicator from the science side of things that there's, the system is, not, is still not back in balance. And I think it's really important to have that 40 year perspective so that we're not a victim of shifting baselines, right? That's oh, sorry. All, that's all the time we have, uh, but please find Nora. She'll be here uh, for the other day. So yeah, thank you so much, Nora. That was excellent. Okay, next up we have um, Alyssa Frederick, who is a postdoctoral scholar with the White Abalone Captive Breeding Program at UC Davis uh, Bodega Moraine Labs. And she's going to be talking to us about the work that um, she has been working on as a postdoc that is really looking at conservation aquaculture of another iconic species, the white abalone. Alyssa, are you able to share your screen? Okay, can you hear me and see me and see slides? Yes. Wonderful. Um, whoops. Thank you so much for having me. I know um, Kristen was really bummed that she couldn't make it, um, but that means that I get to participate. So um, there's the silver lining. Um, so I'm a postdoc at UC Davis and I'm in the White Abalone Captive Breeding Program. Um, I'll be, I'm delivering this talk from Western Sonoma County, which sits on the occupied and unceded land of the Coast Miwok and Southern Como people, and for whom abalone are incredibly culturally and ecologically important. And the word abalone comes from Rumson, which is traditionally spoken in what is now the Monterey Bay area. Um, well, let me see if, okay, there we go. Um, so there are, I'm going to talk specifically about white abalone um, in this talk, but just to kind of orient everyone to all the different abalone, we have seven species um, that span the coast, uh, the western coast of North America from the, the very southern tip of Alaska all the way down to the southern tip of the Baja Peninsula. Um, but there are 50 or more abalone species worldwide, and they're on every continent except for Antarctica. And most of the species that we have here um, on this in North America are considered endangered or threatened due to overharvest disease and environmental stressors. And we care a lot about abalone. They have really strong cultural, economic, and ecological importance. So starting with um, the cultural importance, I'm a settler, so I'm going to let um, uh, Ariana Henthorne, who's a, a member of the Sherwood Valley Band of Pomo Indians, um, share why this is a culturally important group of animals. So hopefully the audio came through, but if not, um, the full quote is here. And then uh, later, the, these animals became really important, um, especially to Asian American immigrants um, who did a lot of fishing for abalone um, and, and later to colonizers as well. And they're obviously a huge part of culture right here in Fort Bragg. Um, so um, yeah, really culturally important. Economically, they support a really rich, um, sustainable aquaculture industry, um, which 
Uh, I know Doug is giving a talk later. Um, this is him on the slide. We do a lot of work with the cultured abalone farm. Um, and they're also really ecologically important. So kind of, um, you know, we learned just now about the importance of sea stars for the, the health of kelp forests. Um, and while abalone don't eat sea urchins, um, they do compete for space and food with them. So they're, they're part of that puzzle as well um, for maintaining healthy kelp forests. Um, but most of our abalone species declined significantly due to overharvest in the 20th century. So this is a graph showing different techniques for fishing abalone over time. Um, and as we went deeper and deeper in the water, we fished more and more of them out. So we see photos like this are not uncommon, um, just piles and piles of abalone shells. And then this is a, um, a graph showing commercial landings of abalone. And we can see that in the 70s, it really just started to plummet to the point of the fisheries all commercial fisheries all being closed in the, in the 90s. Um, the total commercial landings for white abalone exceeded 280 metric tons. And we estimate that there are fewer than two metric tons remaining in the wild. And that's a 99% decline in just about a decade in the 70s. Um, despite the closure of the fishery in 1996, white abalone didn't rebound. Um, that's because they're really bad at long distance relationships. So they, they spawn eggs and sperm into the water column. And if they're not close enough together, then they don't make babies. Um, so the, the animals left in the wild were too far apart to do that. Um, and we don't have any evidence of, of wild reproduction um, in recent years. So in 2001, white abalone became the first marine invertebrate to be federally listed as endangered in the US Endangered Species Act. Um, at the time, we thought abalone would be a really easy species to save because not only are there abalone on every continent except for Antarctica, but there are also abalone farms on every continent except for Antarctica. Um, and those farms are both for direct commercial harvest and for producing the seed for growing out and later harvesting in the ocean which could be a good mechanism for um, saving the species. Um, and California has been a global leader in the development of abalone aquaculture. So this is the top photos of the cultured abalone farm, which you'll hear more about later. Um, and by leveraging California's abalone aquaculture expertise and infrastructure, white abalone can be produced in captivity and outplanted in the wild. Um, and I joined the program about one month after the first wild outplanting in the fall of 2019. Um, and so we're at this phase now where we're producing tons of animals um, in captivity and putting them out in the wild um, so that they are hopefully end up like their ancestors did um, living happily out in the intertidal. I mean, subtitle. Um, so in the year 2000, approximately 20 abalone from the remnant population that was still left were brought to a facility in Southern California, which is photographed here for culturing. Um, in 2001, they produced over 100,000 juveniles. So they had over 100,000 one-year-old animals. Um, unfortunately, when those animals reached about a year old, 95% of them died from a new disease called withering syndrome. And this disease is caused by a bacterium that infects the animal's esophagus. Um, and it's interesting because it's, it's temperature dependent. So in cool water, the animals might be asymptomatic, um, but when the water warms up, the bacteria prol proliferates and the animals can, will stop eating um, and they'll start to digest their own tissue. And this is what that looks like. So the animal on top, these are both red abalone, um, are, is a healthy animal. This is looking underneath, like if we flip the shell over, um, where their tissue it comes all the way out to the edge of the shell and beyond. And then the animal on the bottom has withering syndrome where um, it has shrunken from basically digesting its own tissue. So the, the permit moved to BML about a decade later in 2011. Um, and we have the three pronged um, kind of groups of expertise that work really well um, for helping to save this species. We work on reproduction and development. We have the shelf, the, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Shelf to Shelf Lab that helps us with their, our pathology. Um, and the eco, the, we have ecology and outplanting experts as well. Um, but we can't really do it alone. It takes this huge diversity of partners to help save this species. So we have partners that specialize in different types of research, including the folks here at UC Davis, some that are doing a lot of education and outreach. And then we also have partners um, like the Cultural Abalone Farm who 
are doing large scale production and helping us um, on the production side. So since the permit moved to UC Davis, um, we've had a huge amount of success. So we've gone from producing a ha few handfuls of animals to over 20 something thousand animals over the last few years, but that's not the 100,000 animals that were produced in 2001 when the program first began in Southern California. Um, and that's how many, 100,000 is basically what we need to be able to outplant each year to save the species. And we're operating b way below that. So how do we get there? Um, we have a few, areas of research that we're really interested in in, in these areas. Um, and UC Davis is doing some of this work, but we're also working with a lot of the partners that I just showed um, on, on this research as well. Um, we're, we're looking at basically reproductive conditioning of our brood stock. So how can we get them to reproduce more and um, be more reliably reproductive? And we're looking at the, the babies once are, they float around in the water column for about a week and then they settle. Um, we Once they're set, settled, we, ha, we do experience a lot of loss. So we're looking at ways to increase their survival of those early juveniles. Um, we have partners that are working on the genetic integrity of our stock. So making sure that we create crosses that should be robust. Um, and then there's a ton of research, really great groundbreaking research on climate resiliency um, and, and thinking about how to build climate resiliency into um, this breeding program. And we have a diverse group of institutions for production and for coming up with um, the, the R&D for in improving production is critical to saving the species. So um, I mentioned this earlier, but we began out planting white abalone in the ocean in 2019, and we've now placed thousands of them into their native habitat in Southern California. Um, and outplanting planting teams are, they're always ready to receive more animals than we can produce here at BML. Um, so some of the take homes are that white abalone, they're gonna go extinct without our help. Um, and but we have the tools to save them and they should be a relatively easy species to save. Um, we really need to invest in partnerships, facilities and resources to save this species efficiently because it's this diverse network of partners that really allows us to do our job. Um, and the knowledge and resources that we're generating to save white abalone will enhance the sustainability and the security of abalone fisheries and commercial aquaculture as well. Um, and given the success that we've seen thus far, we're, we're really hopeful about the future of this species, but we're also pretty anxious. Um, white abalone populations, they are at the brink of extinction and we have to act really quickly to save them, which is what we're trying to do. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for um, inviting me to join. Um, it was really interesting hearing the talks earlier as well. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions if that's possible. <laughs> All right, we have one question. So, Yeah, so the question has to do with uh, permitting challenges for outplanting um, animals in the abalone, uh, white, white abalone breeding program and trying to understand what kind of, if you face the same hurdles that others are facing um, with this species. Yeah, so at the, the captive breeding program, um, we are the, the production and research side of everything right now, not the outplanting side. So I did talk about that, but um, so NOAA is in charge of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is leading the, the called planting work. Um, and they work really closely with the Bay Foundation, Power Marine Research Group, and, and some of our other partners. Um, so I'm actually, unfortunately, not too familiar with the outplanting side because our permit is to hold the animals here. Um, but if you email Kristen about it, um, she, she would be able to answer or direct you to, to kind of a better answer than I can. All right, thank you for that. Um, Alyssa, again, uh, that was a great talk and great introduction to everyone about the White Abalone Breeding Program and how academic research is partnering with NOAA and with 
um, commercial entities to um, start to help recover a species. Uh, I'm really excited about our next speaker uh, coming to us from Hog Island Oyster Company. We have Gary Fleener, who's going to talk to us kind of as this transition from really thinking about conservation aquaculture by itself um, to how industry is engaging not only in uh, work that supports native species, um, but on how um, their organization views native species and conservation um, opportunities as a way to diversify um, what they do with their business. So uh, join me in welcoming Gary. Thanks, Kevin. Everybody hear me okay? So while she's queuing us up here, uh, this is gonna be from a little different perspective as Kevin said, because I work for uh, a commercial oyster company uh, founded by my boss and colleague there. So if you have hard questions later, aim them at him. And if you have easy questions, you can aim them at me. But uh, Hog Island Oyster Company uh, is gonna celebrate its 40th birthday next year. And uh, the majority of that trajectory has really been in the commercial aquaculture sector. Uh, we farm oysters in Tamales Bay and, uh, oh good, uh, I'm a little scared after watching everybody else. So I've got a little visual diorama for you here. So we uh, farm oysters in Tamales Bay. We have a hatchery operation and a nursery operation in Humboldt Bay. And uh, as of a few weeks ago, we finally uh, navigated, as many of you have uh, observed the permitting process. We have a grow farm in Humboldt Bay as well. We're installing that. In fact, our other founder is in Humboldt Bay right now installing an oyster farm. Uh, but you can see from the pictures, we're quite diversified. And one of the themes that I want to kind of weave into my presentation to you is the importance of diversification in the business model that John and Terry have put together. So uh, you can see our algae culture room up in Humboldt. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, this is a commercial scale flupsy. We have three of those in Humboldt Bay, and uh, you can see a big bin of seed oysters being moved around in that system. Uh, the bottom picture is uh, some French style rack and bag oyster aquaculture in Tamales Bay. John and Terry, they are still having a good time apparently after, after 39 years. Uh, one of the very unique things in the state of California is that Hog Island has its own constellation of seafood restaurants as well. We have five restaurants in the greater Bay Area, and <clears throat> it creates a business model that is essentially completely vertically integrated from larvae to table, and even before the larvae, right? Uh, and so uh, why then would we be fiddling around with uh, a conservation aquaculture kind of question or problem. And that's where we're going to really uh, explore here. Because uh, as we all know, things change, uh, sometimes at faster rates and slower rates. And one of the things I value most about the company where I work is the idea of diversification has been super important. And I think we believe that diversification will make us a more resilient company. So we have hatchery operations. We have farms in two areas. We have restaurants in different uh, markets. Uh, but we also are involved in some more experimental efforts at diversification. And that's where our overlap with conservation aquaculture really takes place. Uh, these are not what I'm going to talk about, but they overlap with some of the other things. Uh, that's some Australian style oyster baskets. And uh, we have observed over many years that they uh, attract a, a really robust uh, native seaweed set. So that's nori, uh, pyropia, that has great potential food value. We've been working with uh, the Fish and Game Commission and, and Randy's group to get permitting together to be able to experiment with harvesting and utilizing that resource. Uh, as Nora said, we're involved with the bull kelp farm up in Humboldt. Uh, these are not things that are making us money right now, but they're helping us learn more about how to diversify our coastal uh, business. So one of the areas where conservation aquaculture and commercial aquaculture and the food system really intersect for us is around native Olympia oysters. And uh, for those of you that are less familiar with them, they are the only native species of oyster on the West Coast from BC to Baja. 
And uh, at one time, uh, both in the pre-European era, most of the middens that you find on the West Coast, that upper diorama that Randy had in his presentation is uh, sort of an artistic uh, uh, reconstruction of what some of the uh, shell middens or shell mounds around the Bay Area might have looked like. And the bottom picture is from the Washington State Historical Archives. Uh, up until the introduction of Atlantic oysters and then eventually Japanese or Pacific or Miyagi oysters, the native Olympia oyster was the oyster on the menu. That's what people had access to. And uh, it's a small oyster, it's a slow growing oyster. Uh, and in its day, it was relatively abundant. Uh, but basically that oyster disappears from the commercial aquaculture landscape as Randy pointed out earlier. Uh, some of that had to do with over harvesting of the wild resource. Some of it had to do with siltation and sedimentation associated with coastal development. Uh, and some of it had to do with the uh, better business model that's afforded by a faster growing larger oyster. And so uh, in general, the native oyster disappears from the menus of the West Coast uh, in about the early 1900s. I mean, we could bracket that in many ways, but it doesn't disappear completely. At the same time, uh, the native Olympia oyster is also incredibly unequally distributed along its, its native range. So there are pockets of them where they are very abundant and uh, as an illustration, we operate in Marin County uh, as well as Humboldt County. And on the east side of Marin County in the San Francisco Bay, you can find native Olympia oysters in their hundreds of thousands in aggregates along riprap and, and traditional habitats. Uh, probably won't want to eat them. <laughs> Water's probably not quite right for that. But on the west side, on Tomales Bay, where our origin story is and where our farm is, uh, we have very few, and we've noticed that they've been declining over the last several years. About 14 years ago, there was a, uh, a recruitment event, and they were essentially a fouling organism uh, around the bay on a lot of things. But today, when you go around, you're more likely to discover uh, the scars. Oops, let me go back to that one. There we go. Of where they used to be, rather than vibrant uh, aggregations of native oysters. So they have become a species of conservation concern uh, in the areas where they are blinking out. So in California, uh, uh, Morrow Bay is an area where they're not very abundant. Uh, Elkhorn Slough in the Monterey Bay area. Tomales Bay has been a little bit marginal, but uh, Ted Groschultz at UC Davis and his team have noticed that they have been declining, the, the actual number of adults. So here's a place where uh, the two circles of commercial aquaculture, an oyster company like Hog Island, and some of the more restorative goals of conservation groups uh, begin to have an opportunity to overlap. So uh, we're gonna cover a lot of interesting debates right here. Luke, uh, Luke is somewhat connected to the slide on the left. Typically with restoration or conservation aquaculture, especially with species like oysters, the hatchery work is very fussy, right? You're trying to settle the animals on, on naturalistic materials like clam shells, and uh, you still have to put all the effort into the hatchery work, but you get very few potentially breeding adults out of the effort that then might be outplanted into your bay or estuary and potentially serve as a, a, a founding uh, broodstock population for recovery. If you use commercial aquaculture techniques to go through that same effort in a hatchery, you can settle hundreds of thousands of animals uh, using uh, modern commercial aquaculture techniques. And so we developed a question. Uh, it, it, this question has been developed by a lot of folks. What would happen if an oyster farm grew native Olympia oysters in aquaculture gear uh, at densities more typical of commercial aquaculture, what would that do to the larval population, the larval abundance in that Bay or estuary, and would that stimulate a recruitment event back into the wild? That's, that's the big overlap there. So uh, got to have, if you can't do science out of a kayak, then it's not really worth your time. That's my point. But uh, so here, 
Uh, let me tell you about the science side of this overlapping pair of circles, and then I'll tell you about the commercial side. So one of the ways that we monitor for uh, recruitment is through the use of recruitment tiles. For those of you that aren't in the uh, science field, that may be. So those are bathroom tiles, right? Set out around uh, some oyster farms in Tomales Bay. That's uh, Ted Groschholz and Chayla Zabin there uh, putting some tiles out. And those tiles essentially allow us to monitor whether or not we're getting any recruitment in a particular year. And uh, there has not been very much recruitment lately, right? And so, uh, what's my next slide? I'm gonna go back to this one. What we were able to do with a little uh, boost, assist from the Nature Conservancy and Pew Charitable Trust is secure a small grant to work with Bodega Marine Labs we took in some wild brood stock from Tomales Bay. They spawned them out, but instead of settling them in that more naturalistic shell format, they settled them on microculture as single oysters for the commercial oyster market. And uh, I took possession just uh, last week from the lab of about 500,000 animals that we're now going to deploy in Tomales Bay at several locations. And Ted and his team will be able to monitor whether or not that introduction of a half million animals, uh, what does that do to larval abundance? Does that stimulate a recruitment event? Uh, what are the ecological, the potential ecological benefits of farming native oysters in the wild? From our side, uh, we have restaurants. We have developed markets for the products that we sell and so we're able to actually take those oysters and travel them straight to the mouths of consumers. And so uh, what you can see here on the commercial side, uh, those oysters are out in the water. This, we, we didn't start this week. We started this several years ago. And so we have a little pilot effort. So these oysters date back to the, a similar effort about three years ago. They're now market size. Three years is a long time to wait for a 50 cent size oyster. So uh, where, you know, Luke wants me to say, we're not going to save the world and make millions of dollars farming native oysters. But what we are able to do is tell the story of a heritage seafood that used to be incredibly important in the state of California and take that back to the market and let people see what that tasted like. So there's some harvest oysters, they're washed up, they're shucked, our incredible uh, uh, social media person uh, was able to blow these stories up for us. And uh, Jamie's got a whole platter of them. Uh, on Valentine's Day last year, we, we kind of blew it up on social media and we put it out at our restaurants and, and people traveled in to try the OG California native oyster. And uh, we think that's pretty exciting. Uh, as these half million come of age, they'll get about two to three years to do their ecological work in the system so we can study that. Uh, and then we're going to harvest them and take them to market as well. Um, and so that's just a little window of where just to kind of circle back as we transition to hearing about commercial aquaculture efforts, there is potential for overlap between commercial uh, uh, operators of all different working waterfront natures and these conservation projects, whether they're seaweed related or abalone related or oyster related. And uh, this is one we're particularly proud of. And with that, I'll take any questions if we have any time for that. Yeah. Top secret folks, since you guys lasted, I brought to make one of your oysters. So at the reception, if you see me with a shucking knife, just kind of come on over. Because how many of you have tasted a native Olympia oyster? Just a couple, right? Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Gary. All right, we're going to take a quick brief break, um, and we're going to try to come back at 2.45. So just take about five minutes, get up, stretch your legs, and then come back in for our commercial aquaculture uh, piece. Thank you so much.
Testing. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, final session, we're almost there, so hang in with us. We'll have uh, fabulous aquaculture ap appetizers after this. But um, Gary kind of teed it up nicely for us. So we're heading into uh, commercial aquaculture, but commercial and conservation aquaculture don't always have to be mutually exclusive. Um, some forms of aquaculture have intrinsic benefits to the environment. But in saying that, what commercial aquaculture does do, or hopefully for the owners, is make some money. Um, and so that's what we're going to we're here from. We're going to hear from uh, four different speakers of um, people that practice aquaculture here in California. Some have been around for a long time, and some are kind of just just getting started and brand new. But this is meant to kind of serve as a as a taste of like what what might be possible here in the um, if an aquaculture park was built. But with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to um, Dan Gozard. He works with uh, Monterey Bay Seaweeds. He's their chief scientist, and he's going to tell you about what they're doing in uh, Moss Landing. Thanks, Dan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Dan Gossard, Daniel Gossard, and I'm the chief scientist at Monterey Bay Seaweeds. And we are at the Moss Landing Marine Labs Aquaculture Facility um, at San Jose State University in Moss Landing, um, California, which is, if you don't know, in the middle of the Monterey Bay in Central California. Um, and I'm here to tell you about land-based seaweed farming. Uh, but first, why, why even are we doing seaweeds? Well, seaweeds facilitate um, human health. We're, we're talking about um, uh, increased uh, macro and micronutrient, talk about iron, potassium, iodine, a lot of fiber, but you can extract a bunch of products from them that are, that are used industrially and scientifically. Uh, we're talking about alginates that uh, if you ever have your uh, dentist uh, mold your teeth, that's made from seaweeds. We'll talk about agar and uh, plates that you can grow uh, uh, microorganisms with. Um, and they're also a really fundamental part of the blue economy. Um, you could tell, you can see the ramifications of them just offshore. I'm not going to go in, into that anymore because um, it's, it's been covered really nicely uh, uh, today and yesterday. Um, so, but I'm talking about um, uh, aquaculture today. And if you, if you look at the, the, this graph um, in orange, uh, we have uh, seaweed aquaculture um, and in light blue is finfish inland. So seaweed aquaculture actually comprises a comparable part of the total offshore aquaculture. Um, and it has tripled over the last two decades and it is continually growing. And now the majority of this is offshore aquaculture and we are a land-based uh, seaweed farm. And there are a bunch of differences between those two, but the primary differences are gonna be scalability differences. It's a lot easier to put uh, minimal amounts of infrastructure into the ocean compared to land-based where you have to put in tanks and put it in an intake pipe and uh, pl uh, plumb all the water. Um, the, uh, and consequentially increased energy costs by, by doing that as well in um, land-based aquaculture you can put on lights in your tanks uh, but you know you're going to have to to create um, uh, seaweed uh, at the same rate uh, independent of season uh, but again that increases energy costs and all of this in, in addition to tanks uh, is gonna have uh, a large uh, overhead. So the overhead for offshore seaweed um, farming is a lot less, um, but you know, we did it. Um, and I'm gonna share with you our business model for how we did it. Um, first, uh, you build your system and then um, we, we use uh, tumble culture tanks, um, which I'm gonna get into in a minute. Uh, you source your material. You're going to get seaweed that grows vegetatively in land. It grows to the point where it fragments, and then both those pieces keep on growing. Uh, you develop a market. We sell seaweeds fresh, fresh, raw, alive. We sell these seaweeds to chefs who cook them and use them in culinary purposes. You can't really, you don't really have that market with offshore aquaculture because you, know, you don't have the ability to take sea, seaweeds and then uh, provide them on demand. We, it's chefs. Uh, uh, they t text us on the same day we get seaweeds out to them. Um, you, once, once you get uh, some profits, you build your capacity, you put more tanks in, uh, you, you 
you plumb them, you fill them with seaweed, and then you use research and development. You can't see that. Use research and development to expand the market uh, by diversifying your products. So tumble culture um, is essentially using airlift inside of a, a conical bottom tank to circulate the tank um, and create a cell. Um, you have a you have a tank. Okay, seen here, I uh, thought it was going to go away. Um, and then uh, it's kind of like a bottom. You add your seawater supply and your drain pipe, and the drain pipe is going to dictate your, your water line, your water level. You, you put your water in, and that's going to be the volume of the tank. And then you put air at the bottom, and then that's going to create a three-dimensional cell where seaweed is going to be tumbling around. Now, when the seaweed tumbles around, it gets a lot of light uh, from on the surface, uh, but most of the time it's actually going to be in the dark. And seaweed doesn't really need uh, to be lit um, the entire time. So you could put 55, gallon, uh, 55 pounds of seaweed in this 1,000-gallon tank, we're talking about six-foot diameter, and it can still produce 15, 20 pounds on a, on a, on a weekly basis. So when we started, we started with whatever tanks we could get our hands on so, uh, cheaper. Um, if you're gonna start um, uh, and a seaweed farm, you're gonna have to deal with what you got. But you know, this is really easy. You plumb it with, with air, you plumb it with water. That's really all the seaweeds need and, and light. Um, and then we eventually built up a, a deck system with thousand gallon tanks. And this is our primary growing facility right here. We have a number of species on these tanks. Uh, deck is just to make it more more easy. You can see Mikey in the top left over there netting out the seaweed, and we do that on a weekly basis. So you, then you, you build your system, and then you source your material. So we started with these two two species. You have Ogo and Dulce in the, on the left and then the right. And for example, the, if if these species are not sold out, essentially our Dulce, for example, uh, we're looking at the same same individual that is propagated in these tanks. Uh, for almost a decade. Um, when we get um, chef, when chefs ask us for seaweed, we take it out of the tank and we package it up and send it out to them. Um, and we started really small um, where uh, the, the owner and his wife know, it's a little family business. So the owner and his wife know a bunch of chefs locally. Um, we started going to the farmer's markets um, and then we started shipping seaweeds and now we ship to distributors as well, who that they have um, uh, uh, sent our seaweed out. We're we're looking at both inland and coastal. So you know, demand for sea, seafood is growing. So we're trying to capitalize on that. Um, and the market opportunities for land-based uh, aquaculture. You know, we can't pr produce. We we produce a lot lower volumes than compared to offshore aquaculture. But because we produce fresh seaweeds, it's a lot. It's a higher value, so we can charge a lot more compared to uh, offshore, especially because offshore is, is uh, sort of monopolized by uh, the Asian market over there. Um, we can't really compete with that. Um, but as we've been expanding um, our infrastructure, we've been able to um, sort of, we've been able to increase our volume and then lower our prices and to make, uh, to move it, shift us a little bit uh, more to the right. And we're currently investigating uh, the middle market, which is uh, looking at consumer packaged goods. Um, and so once you know, once you sell sell um, some seaweeds, you develop your capacity. So this is the Moss Landing Marine Labs aquaculture facility here. Um, it's a little bit less than an acre, and um, this is uh, 2015. This is before I started. At this point, I was uh, scraping holes on a hook line system, and um, I was thinking about going to uh, grad school. So I went to grad school. I got employed next year. I'm not going to say anything about causality, but now this is what it looks like and uh it's it's expanded it's expanded substantially um remember this is this is um so the in the red um is monterey Bay seaweeds and um we we had 20 times our footprint um 30 times the volume and 40 times the revenue and importantly the monterey Bay seaweeds is a revenue neutral company so most of our profits have gone back into uh labor right now we have five employees total And we are producing 200 pounds of seaweed a week, and that equates to uh, more than 100 tons per acre, which is uh, very substantial. Um, 
uh, especially for the footprint that we're using. Uh, again, we started with these two species. We've expanded the market uh, to include a number of other species, and some of these uh, incorporate uh, 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 permanent collections from the intertidal, and then we sort of ranch them. We bring them back into our tanks and grow them out there a little bit more. Started, started to investigate kelps in the bottom right. And we've also recently incorporated hatchery techniques to diversify this market even farther. And this is this is both um, taking the, the high value products as well as the middle value products um, and expanding there. So this is the footprint of Monterey Bay seaweeds, less than a 20th of an acre. We're talking about less than the size of this room here. Um, and this is the mill site. And so if you, if you did a, if you, uh, put four times the footprint of Monterey Bay seaweeds looking at more than a million dollars revenue uh, if you can maintain the market. And then hypothetically, um, fit the, if you use 75 acres of the mill site, uh, we're looking at nine, uh, 9,000 tons a year. And it's, it's also looking at $400 million in revenue. Uh, the 9,000 tons a year is 35 times the total seaweed cultivation in the United States. But let's be real, this is, this is not really gonna happen. Um, there, there are some, there are some um, difficulties in, in doing this and you really don't need a, a large uh, uh, um, area to, to really uh, create a, a good sea, land-based seaweed farm. Um, some of the pitfalls of this, you absolutely need an in, intake pipe that uh, that's, it's uh, that is also required that you have a public private partnership to provide this intake pipe. You're not going to be putting it in yourself um, and maybe not even um, uh, providing the energy for this. For example, um, we have an equity partnership with San Jose State University and Moss Landing Marine Labs where um, we don't pay for the energy for this. Um, and then the infrastructure costs, um, including the tanks, that is that's pretty substantial as well that's going to prohibit that huge expansion but you know we're doing it slowly one step at a time um energy cost again they're going to be prohibited especially when you're increased uh, uh put lights on top um in in winter seasons and a lot of the labor is going to be going to quality insurance of your seaweed products although the quality of the seaweed products in in uh, land-based aquaculture is better than offshore aquaculture it still takes a little bit of maintenance of these tanks and the seaweeds to maintain a really crisp product that fresh product that the the chefs like um and the market you know seaweed uh, sorry seafood in general you know we we have the, the demand is increasing but uh you know it's it's tough it's we're we're trying to um get the word out we're talking with all all the chefs that we can um but you know it's it's hard to get people to get this idea that consuming seafood is going to be more healthier when it is. Um, so we're, we're trying our best to expand that market, um, as well as volatility and demand is a huge part. Um, if you're, if you have a chef that wants 30 pounds of seaweed, uh, one week, once a month, uh, what are you going to do for the rest of those weeks when the seaweed is reproducing, um, in the tanks? Um, it's, you have to do something with it. So, so sometimes we have more supply than demand at, at times. But, you know, the, this is just a little tiny footprint and, you know, you can do some other stuff that's really cool with the with these tumble culture tanks. Um, they're multi-purpose. Um, for example, you can look at this is this is one of the species that um, we're trying to sell over there. We call them baby bulls um, and the chefs love them. You know, you, you shoot uh, like uh, cheese or, or yogurt in the, in the nematocyst. Um, but you can also use them for like conservation purposes. Um, you know, if, if this if this is a way to help restore, um, you know, the coastal ecosystems, that might be a way to do it. Um, it, it for uh, you know, current uh, species that need uh, need to be protected and restored, or for future species as well. Um, as, as so there's so you can also do integrated multi-trophic aquaculture if you're looking at um, uh, again building on that conservation sort of idea. Um, seaweed tumble culture is a good place to do that. We were talking about red abalone in the right, white abalone in the middle, and if you're if you're doing anything with ant, urch, urchin ranching, um, that's that's a possibility as well. Um, lastly, bioremediation, um, seaweed aquaculture. You know they need nutrients and they need sunlight. And if you're going to have if you're going to have animals in tanks at an aquaculture facility, uh, seaweeds can help remediate that the nutrient rich effluent um, that's coming out of those tanks. 
so again this is just a little tiny footprint um and it would it's a it seems like it, it's a good idea to just uh, add one of these if, if you're going to be considering an aquaculture facility um that just for your consideration um if you have any questions let me know thank you What are we, we're selling it we're, we're eating it oh you can put it in soups um you could you could fry it up deep fry that's pretty good too yes um they they are open they're open air we we use air blowers that are connected to the the air and um it's not doesn't have a lid or anything like that um yeah because it, it, we try to maximize the light that comes in uh, the, the, the fresh water, if you have a certain amount of flow through is, is not is negligible, uh, depends on what species you're dealing with. Um, but primarily like in with rain, um, it's not really a, a problem. Thanks, Dan. Okay. So next up, we have sunken seaweeds. And so this is a, uh, a team of Tori and Leslie uh, speaking today. Is both of them? Oh, Leslie. No, this is me. Leslie Ball will be speaking today and she'll, she'll be telling us about um, what they've been up to and what they're going to do shortly in the uh, world of seaweed. Thank you, Leslie. Can you read out your notes? Thanks, everybody. Uh, bear with me if I get winded. I'm pretty sure I have a foot against my lungs right now. So, um, but um, thanks so much. I wanted to start by thanking Sarah and Luke and like every, a lot of people that have put this on. This event has been really mind blowing and amazing thus far. Um, and I'm lucky to be going kind of later in the day because most of the folks that have presented have said all that needs to be done um, said about seaweed farming so really just sit back and enjoy um, listening to our journey about seaweed aquaculture so my name is leslie i'm here with my partner tori uh, we founded sunken seaweed uh, back in 2017 so we're going to tell you a little bit about um, our process starting seaweed farming um, so first i have to kind of say um, how we got started um, this story is relevant to Fort Bragg. So um, we met in 2014 while undergrads at Humboldt State, now Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, and we had uh, the privilege, the kind of ominous privilege of being research technicians um, with um, a team of, of researchers looking at marine protected areas through the North Coast. So we did a great, a great deal of surveying um, right here in Fort Bragg. Um, this story made it on the cover of the Humboldt magazine. Um, it was a really exciting time to be researching and to be cutting our teeth as marine ecologists. Um, but as you know, um, in 2014, 2015, I don't have to beat a dead horse here. Um, it's already been said, but during this time where we're actively researching in the inner tidal, um, we were witnessing you know, this perfect storm decimation of kelp forests um, and then a subsequent loss of you know, a lot of the marine animals that thrive in these kelp forests. So um, that really set our course. You know, we graduated and were a little bit depressed about outcomes for um, these ecosystems that we'd come to love. Um, but it also shaped our career path. And we knew that we wanted to have jobs that were um, dedicated to enhancing kelp forest ecosystems. So um, we started looking in California for options uh, to get started with seaweed farming. There really were not many uh, folks doing it in California at all. So we had to look elsewhere. Um, we stumbled into uh, some folks from the Northeast of the US, Green Wave. Um, Kendall, Kendall's here in the room, I think today. Yeah, um, hi Kendall. Um, and they were super helpful, like from the outset um, to two marine ecologists that just had a lot of questions. Um, their model, as you see here in this cartoon, is three-dimensional ocean farming. Um, and we got schooled in polyculture from Randy earlier. Um, 
So that's what this is. It's a polyculture with bivalves and different species of marine macroalgae. Um, so we took this idea, GreenWave helped us a lot with, um, you know, just logistics for gear and like how to get started. Took this idea and adapted it to what could it look like in California. And what we found was that um, to do seaweed farming in California, we were looking at maybe three or four years um, through the permitting and leasing process and maybe 100K or maybe half a million dollars. Um, so it was like outlook was kind of grim. Um, these are just some of the agencies that you work with um, when you're trying to get a seaweed farm in the water here. Um, so yeah, it was kind of daunting for us um, with definitely not 500K in the bank to, to facilitate this, um, but you know, enter the Port of San Diego. Um, and I know most of you that were here yesterday got to hear from Paula, Sylvia. Um, so we found out about this incubator kind of as it was getting started. It was maybe a year or two old. And um, we approached Paula. She was really encouraging, saying seaweed aquaculture is definitely something they want to facilitate, um, but also was very straightforward about what we needed to do to get our act together and be legitimate enough to, for them to fund and partner with. But, oh, you can't see the News 10 headline. Ultimately, it says, it says like seaweed farming in San Diego Bay or something. Um, we were successful. Uh, we pitched to the port in kind of like this Shark Tank style proposal. We were successful. So we were awarded initially with a one-year contract with the port. Um, $137,000 to fund, um, you know, the labor, the equipment to get going, and most importantly, the assistance um, with port staff and Sea Grant fellows um, to facilitate expedited permitting and get us in the water um, really, really quickly. Um, and so once we did that, we set about on, you know, installing our pilot farm, quarter acre little farm in San Diego Bay. Um, we partnered with San Diego State University, which was pretty critical to our success. They offered a marine lab um, where we could set up a hatchery, um, grow our baby kelps and other seaweeds and um, set about this one year project. And really the, the goals of this project were pretty clearly established with our port contract. Um, we were to just test feasibility see how seaweed farming could be of use, if at all, in San Diego Bay. So what we did is test all different ki kinds of algae, different species, all native to San Diego. Um, we tested different methods for hatchery and for grow out. And we really explored what kinds of products or services even could be rendered from seaweed grown in San Diego Bay. Um, so it was a lot of failing forward. We learned a ton that year. Um, and, you know, we learned about all of the different products. Um, we kind of developed um, different uses, different avenues for the seaweeds that we were growing. Um, these are just a few because it's fun to look at all, all the potential with, with seaweed and the products. Um, but, you know, we kind of had this catch-22 where we were learning about growing seaweed, learning what we could do with it. Um, but not actually able to sell it to commercialize um, due to um, infrastructural limitations. Uh, we were partnered with San Diego State, but we did not have the same kind of um, deal that uh, Monterey Bay seaweeds have. Like, you know, selling out of the university was a no-go, non-starter kind of thing. Um, so we kind of just had to get creative and we've been actively engaged in research. That's how we've stayed afloat as a company. Um, so we've learned a lot and made really wonderful partnerships um, in the meantime, but you know, it's been about four and a half years. And so we're really excited after all the learning that we've done, all of the strategic and super collaborative partnerships that we've made. Um, we're just now like, you know, this month kind of thing, starting to expand up to Humboldt Bay as well. So we get to participate in San Diego and keep going with, um, you know, the port as they find infrastructure for commercialization and product development stuff. 
And we're moving up to Humboldt. And as you've already heard from other speakers, you know, San Diego Bay and Humboldt Bay are unique in that they offer like, permit ready um, aquaculture things specific for seaweed. So, um, you know, it's it's been a real amazing journey. And, you know, because of the collaborative nature that seaweed farming has become, like we're really excited to help and answer any questions and give support for that journey to begin here as well. Um, and I think that's all that I really have, um, but I have my email address here and then happy to answer questions now or on our little walkabout later today. Thanks. Okay, so next up we have Doug Bush. Um, Doug is the uh, manager and I believe co-owner of the Cultured Abalone Farm, which I think is now our largest abalone farm in California. Doug was planning on joining us in person, but um, unfortunately he couldn't make it at the last minute. So he's gonna be joining us via uh, Zoom. So Doug, if you're there, um, go ahead and share your screen. Doug, are you there? Doug. It's my accent. Not Doug. Not now. Uh, I can, yeah, we can hear you now, Doug. You good? You got audio? We have audio, but are you planning on sharing a presentation or not? Yeah, I can share a screen. Do you need to enable that from your end or do you do it from you me? Should be, you should be good. Is this working? You should see an overview of my farm if it works. We can only see you so far. Maybe a delay. Where's the... <clears throat> Do you know where the option is for the share? Oh, here it is. There's the share screen. Got it. How okay now yeah and if you just put it in like presenter mode perfect all right take it away doug is it up yeah it's up all right great thanks so much um I, first of all let me apologize that i wasn't able to make it up i was really looking forward to getting up there and uh, i was able to share uh with sarah a, a, a bit um year many many years ago uh, a sort of uh, um, stunning number of years ago. Uh, <clears throat> right after I finished my undergraduate, I, I spent a summer in uh, the Mendocino, Fort Bragg, Casper area. I was actually, you know, as a, as a young person does, live, living, uh, living in a tent next to my car, uh, at straight inland from, from uh, Casper. Uh, took, my, took my evening beers at the Casper Inn, and, and actually the, the Casper headlands there um, were the first place that I ever went snorkeling and, and, and saw my first abalone. I had a, I had a little job down at the Mendocino art center, uh, firing, uh, kilns and mixing clay for the, for the art center there. And, uh, just had, was living the dream, you know, living the 20 something life on the, on the Mendocino coast for a summer and, and I'll never forget it. And it obviously it, it, it burned a real impression in me because, after that, you know, I, I you know, uh, foot loosed it around for a while, spent some time in Colorado skiing, spent some time in Africa teaching in the Peace Corps. But I always had that that uh, that aquaculture that that, you know, that pull towards the salty briny life, the critters, the the the, the surfing, the, you know, and, and the food, namely. And maybe it just was always meant to be, but but uh, some some years later in 2004, um, after getting a master's up at uh, UC Davis in the Bodega Marine Lab, um, I was offered a position to 
work down at the cultured abalone farm here in uh, Santa Barbara coast. And I've uh, been here ever since. Um, since 2004, we've gone through a couple of organizational changes, but we remain at our core uh, a, a viable commercial operation doing marine aquaculture located on the coast in California. So the picture that you see uh, uh, here, this is, a, this is an overview of our farm, a little drone shot of our farm. We're not big by any sort of uh, global standard for abalone farming. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty small potatoes farm, but we do okay. Uh, we sell about 35 tons per year of California red abalone haliotis rufescens, same species that uh, you guys, and this is one of those, usually at this point in, I have to spend a fair amount of time talking about what abalone are, because there's a lot of people for whom it's just not kind of in their lexicon of the coastal abundance of California and, and, and the seafood species. I mean, it's such a, such a part of life up, up in the North Coast and the fences and the, the, the cedar fences with the shells nailed to them for decoration and, you know, the, uh, the, the campfire cookout, uh, you know, not, not in recent years, obviously, but um, the, the, the recreational fishery and the, the loss to the uh, North Coast economy and what that recreational fishery brings is, I, I understand and, and feel dearly what, what you guys have, have lost in the, in the abalone not being available and part of your economy right now. We fill a different part of the seafood landscape and the seafood business landscape and the, and the economic landscape through our production of, of California red abalone in the farm setting. It hasn't been a commercial species California wide since the mid late 90s. Um, and our farming of product has, to a certain extent, filled that void. Most of our product, it's a common misconception that we export product. Um, since 2008, uh, due to the strength of the dollar and the competitive, competitiveness of the business landscape in Japan and China and Korea, um, we have not exported products since 2008. Um, we do very well selling whole live product domestically. Mo the vast majority of our product does not leave California. We sell a little bit in uh, Washington and Oregon, a little bit in Nevada, a little bit in Texas, Colorado, Michigan. But for the, the, the vast majority of our product stays in California as whole live product and sort of fulfills that you know, very, very niche high end desire for uh, a live California seafood product. And to a certain extent, we're able to displace import pressure from imported live Korean abalone, Chilean abalone, uh, Australian abalone. Uh, in some cases, these are live. In other cases, these are uh, frozen or canned or, or shucked product. Um, <clears throat> in the next slide, this is, this is a, let me go back one and just give you the real quick. So what we have, you see in the center lower part of the, the slide here, that's our hatchery and office building. Um, all of our tanks are, are shade cloth. You'll see kind of in the central lower, there's a very, very small uh, shade cloth square right in the kind of center of the riparian area. That's the high point of our farm. That's where we pump uh, seawater to, and then we're gravity fed through a distribution through the, the rest of our farm. We pump about 2000 gallons a minute, 24 seven. Uh, we have 100 horsepower uh, pumps that are located just off the screen to the left on the other side of this railroad trestle. Um, and we have intakes, which go 1,600 feet offshore and terminate at about 40 feet of depth in the ocean. Uh, the 40 foot of depth is really key to our summertime and fall operations. We're, we're below the thermocline and are able to avoid the lens of warm water that we get in, in late summer and, and get the cool water that's really um, essential to uh, good growth performance with, uh, with the red abalone. Uh, underneath the shade cloth that you see is a system of tanks. It's all gravity fed back down from, the, from that high point from those head tanks. Uh, all of our tanks are about, 20, about 1,000 gallons each. Um, and uh, we have about 400 production units uh, in our own built-in hatchery. So we, we do spawning of abalone. Uh, the egg, the fertilized embryo of an abalone is about 
as small as you can make a, a, a dot with your sharpest pencil, just barely visible to the naked eye, about finest, finest, most finely ground pepper is what it looks like in the water column. And we'll grow that up to about a market size of about a hundred gram animal. Um, they look like little wee babbies compared to what you guys are all used to up, up in the North Coast. So this is underneath the shade cloth. This is, you get an idea uh, in the background there. Those are rack tanks, which house our smaller abalone up to about uh, an inch and a half in size, maybe about 20, 20 grams. And uh, at that point, they move into these, these larger tanks. Um, each one of them gets about, you know, three to four gallons a minute of, uh, of seawater uh, is aerated largely as a mechanical function to uh, remove dead spots and keep water moving within the tanks. And you can see on the left, those, those tanks are, are filled with uh, kelp. We do not use um, we do not use uh, soybean or casein or wheat middlings or any sort of like kibble uh, as as our our feed inputs, and that's nice because our input is, and nutrient cycling is is incredibly local. We have a 50 foot steel uh, modified landing craft, which is our mechanical kelp harvester. We are currently the only uh, permitted Fish and Game Commission licensed and permitted mechanical harvester of macrocystis giant kelp, uh, distinct from your North Coast Nereocystis bull kelp. The macrocystis is an annual. Um, we do have similar issues. There is encroachment with purple urchin barrens out, especially out towards Point Conception. But uh, I have to say that within the last three years, uh, the kelp canopy in Southern California has been um, the best kelp canopy that uh, I have data for and in, in, in realistically in, in, the, in the 20 or so years that I've been involved in this operation. Um, kelp is super, uh, you know, ephemeral. It comes and it goes. It's highly dynamic. You have boom years and bust years. And, you know, it, it, within my time here in 2012, we had a swell event that ripped up every single last scrap of kelp all the way up the channel. And we really, really had to scramble to get inputs. We harvest and dry kelp uh, for contingency situations, but we're highly vested in sustainable management and harvest of kelp from wild beds. That is our, our fisheries uh, and, and harvest application of our, of our business model. And then our farming and husbandry uh, exists with the marine snail in these tanks that you see here. Um, just in the way that if you're a dairy farmer, you have to understand grass uh, as as snail farmers, uh, we we have to be very attuned to and, and sensitive to the the comings and goings and, and, and seasonal cycles that are represented by the the, the offshore kelp bed. Um, they're tremendously renewable resource with with massive potential uh, uh, for use of fixed carbon from the marine environment and taking something with relatively low dollar per biomass value and converting it into something that has very high dollar per biomass value. So these are our abalone. These are the, I, I threw these on here specifically uh, for, for the North Coast crowd. This is about as big as they get from our, our farm. We call these, um, we, we work, we have the, the, the privilege and, and honor of working with a lot of uh, pretty Pretty nice chefs and uh, and winemakers in the Santa Barbara County, um, and so uh, anybody who's who's got any exposure to the wine industry probably will recognize uh, the large bottles of wine, the almost comically large bottles of wine. Uh, a twelve uh, liter bottle of wine is called a Balthazar. So these are twelve hundred gram. Um, abalone, and we, we call these our Balthazars, and we've just in the last couple a year or so uh, made these available for retail sale on our on our website, and uh, it's the closest you get to sort of like that. They're just about seven inches, so just about what you would have been able to like squeak through with a gauge in the in the in the last last days of the of the recreational fishery. I have. Um, a hope to grow up uh, a 1500 gram, which would be more solid. Uh, and that would obviously at 1500 grams, that would be your Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, related to your 15 liter bottle of wine. And I have a, a, a kind of a vanity project where I want to grow 
uh, a few like legit 10 inch trophy sized abalone. Um, you know, uh, there's, there are, there are people out there that will, that will make those, that will make those purchases, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's a fun aspect to be able to, to, to bring these into the marketplace. This, on the other hand, is the far other extreme end of the spectrum. So what you see here are baby abalone about uh, six, six to eight months old. And uh, this is the, the backside of a tile from our hatchery. Um, those squares that you see there are the, the surface relief of a, of a tile that embeds in the, in the thin set. Those are one square inch. Uh, so you get a, a sense of those, those tiny little baby red abalone. And then that's dulse, the palmaria that uh, you've already seen in a couple of the seaweed operations. Um, we've been tumble culturing both the gracilaria and the dulse seaweeds here um, as part of our commitment to feeding uh, abalone with, with seaweeds, with all natural diets. Abalone are expensive. It's a, pro, it's a, it's a, a consequence of the uh, enormous amount of time that it takes to grow them up to market size. Um, and it's a, it's a niche buy. Nobody needs to buy an abalone. It's not a commodity. We're not in there mixing it up with, uh, with chicken thighs and, and, and such. So if you if somebody wants to commit the the dollar value and the and the prep time to to enjoying abalone, it's it's highly important that that abalone is authentic in taste and appearance. So we take taste and appearance very very seriously here, and that's why we put so much emphasis on the diet. Um, they are what they eat. Their flavor is a direct result of the foods that they eat and the combination of the macrocystis uh, kelp that we feed to the abalone combined with the uh, unique marine sugars, the, the carrageenan that's found in, um, in the antioxidant pigments that's found in the dulse and in the, in the ogo seaweeds. Um, these directly contribute to the unique flavors of the marine snail that makes abalone taste like they do. If you were to feed them soybean meal, if you were to feed them poultry byproduct meal, you would just have, in my opinion, a glorified chicken breast, and it would not do justice to uh, the people that that uh, that want to seek out abalone and, and and get that taste of California. So that's that's very core, paramount part of our sort of of corporate value in terms of what we're trying to accomplish with. Uh, this low trophic um, shellfish uh, seaweed production, seaweed and shellfish production program. Uh, and then this is this is pretty close to a, a market sized abalone. And you, again, you see that that commitment to the red seaweeds is evident in in the in the shell and the banding and the appearance of the abalone. Abalone, as you guys probably know, are are they're named by color. Red abalone are are not red because of something specific to them as a species, but where they occupy the, the, the coastal ecology. Um, they tend to live where there are dense aggregations of red seaweeds and those red seaweeds um, accumulate the, those red pigments in the shell. If you were to only feed a red abalone with, uh, with macrocystis kelp, you would get this greenish, this beautiful like jade and, and emerald greenish color. Uh, if you feed a white abalone with red seaweed, it will be red. If you feed a, a, a green abalone with, with red seaweed, it will be that crimson red color. So these, these bands that you see um, have sort of become uh, something that we're very good at creating with our product and, and a bit of our, uh, our calling card for the way that our, our abalone uh, present in the marketplace. The shade cloth that you saw in the first slide uh, keeps the fouling um, diatom growth uh, to a minimum on the on the backs of the shells and the stocking density that we keep the abalone in those in those tanks they they tend to graze each other's backs and and keep the keep the product uh, 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 very clean. Um, I'd like to just you know uh, conclude uh, my sort of overview of our operation by by saying that you know I believe very very strongly in the in the transparency model we've managed through um, some amount of luck and some amount of uh, some amount of decision making but you know let's let's be honest a lot of luck uh, to find ourselves in a position where we are a commercially viable marine aquaculture business operating in California I believe that there is room for others at that table I am vested 
intensely in seeing the growth of a aquaculture industry in California. And I will throw open my doors and my make time available for people who are trying to make this happen. I would love to see the expansion of a shellfish and seaweed industry in Fort Bragg. It's a working waterfront community. It's a commercial fishing community. Um, commercial fishing or seafood, commercial seafood community does not begin and end with one farmer. It does not begin and end with one fisherman. It's a hugely integrated community of commercial participants. It includes processing, cold storage, boat yards, receivers, restaurants, sales. The commercial seafood and fishing industry is, is a wildly diverse and it's, it's a backbone to working waterfront communities. And the, the sort of metaphor, the rising tide lifting boats thing only works when we're transparent and collaborative. There's a sort of pervasive underlying um, um, conventional wisdom out there that aquaculture and commercial fishing are, you know, have this de facto adversarial sort of relationship. And I think that's unfortunate and it doesn't need to be the case. We have a lot more in common than we do apart. Uh, we've seen a lot of this. I'm not going to step on uh, Urchinomics presentation, but we've been working hard on the the purple urchin restoration project with the with the seaweeds that we produce and producing a, a, a really beautiful, high quality, fattened purple urchin. That's a product that comes from the cooperation of urchin divers, a, a, an aquaculture farm facility processors and know-how from a lot of different participants. And it only works if a lot of people come to the table with a, with a spirit of innovation and trying to create something that is uniquely Californian and problem solving and ecologically and sustainability minded. Um, so I, I'd be happy, I'm, I, again, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join you in person. Um, you know, I got the thing and uh, was unable to travel. But um, my door is always open. Um, I've, I've hosted many people in that room at my farm and, and will continue to do so. And uh, if you're interested in, in reaching out to me, I'd, I'd be happy to, to, to guide people along the way and, and, uh, and help brainstorm and, and come up with some creative solutions for uh, things that Fort Bragg might uh, have in its, in, in its uh, vision plan. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks for that, Doug. Uh, we've got a little bit of time for some questions. If anyone has them for Doug, I'll re relay them to you, Doug, please. Uh, my question is about commercial fish. So in other countries, the animals are sold locally for more or less for So, Doug, the question is um, based on the regulations associated with commercial fishing of abalone and the restrictions associated with that in California. Does any of that play a part with your farm product? And maybe, Doug, if you could take off your big abalone screen so we can see your lovely face. Yeah, how do I? Oh, there's stop share. Does that work? Can you see me? Yes. <clears throat> So, I'm sorry, the question was the, uh, uh, regarding existing abalone regulations and how the uh, regulations governing uh, wild abalone fisheries interface with farmed abalone regulations. Was that? It's similar, it? yeah. I, and I'm paraphrasing here. It's, you're aware of the various like um, regulations associated with commercial fishing of abalone and, you know, the, the prohibition of being able to sell um, commercially wild caught abalone associated with a shell, does any of that translate to you farming abalone? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we, the, the, the abalone which we produce and, and, and sell is, is uh, for, well, for starters, it's, it's only about three and a quarter inch shell length. So it's, it's if it were a, a fished product, it would be way, way, way below size. But we're able to sell um, anything that we produce under the sort of um, convention that it's that it, that it's farmed to produce. For the the hundred gram size has, is kind of uh, the sweet spot for um, the costs uh, and time associated with abalone production 
Um, so that's kind of emerged as the, uh, I won't say an industry standard, but close to it. Um, there are conversations, we, we pay close attention. We sit in a lot of MRC meetings and, uh, and Fish and Game Commission meetings. We're pretty active participants and observers of like the abalone uh, uh, restoration plans and the, and the management plans. We participate in the white abalone species recovery plan. We're, we're uh, hoping to contract with the black abalone species recovery plan. It's, in my opinion, we as farmers are really, um, should be vested in the recovery of a wild species. And I would not be opposed to a limited entry of a, of a commercial fishery if it met all the required criteria for sort of sustainability and management. Like for example, let's, there have been some, some people working together with Sankey Master from the department uh, to evaluate whether there might be a limited entry sort of a red abalone fishery that could, could be reinstated out at the Channel Islands at San Miguel Island, I think. Don't, don't quote me on that or, or you know, fact check it anyway. But you know, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I think that if, if anything, it would build um, sort of our little corner, Santa Barbara, as the place for um, innovative and sustainability for abalone, right? To have like a complementary like farmed product and a wild caught product, both kind of coming through the same, the, the, out of the same geographic area. I think it, 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 would, it would be mutually beneficial. Um, I don't know with the current um, uh, current feelings surrounding uh, general health of of the North Coast. If you know I, I, the most recent the most recent work that's that's come through the the Fish and Game Commission and the MRC is has not given us a great deal of optimism for the reopening of the of the recreational fishery in the, in the short term. I very much hope it does for you know for uh, for economic reasons and just because I want to see abalone, you know, back on those reefs. Thanks. But yeah, also to paraphrase, so yeah, the, the laws associated with um, the, the commercial um, fishery, well, now that we don't have a commercial fishery, they don't apply to the farm products, so. They do not, they do not. Sure. They're distinct. We, we have plenty of laws governing us, they're separate. <laughs> Another question? Doug, that was Fred, Fred Carr. He was um, inflating your ego, saying you're a very collaborative, nice person. Oh. <laughs> but, um, what, one more question, Tori. So Tori asks, how critical um, abalone culture, in your opinion, is that it relies on kelp, given the, the lack of kelp that we see in the North Coast, versus tumble culture of an alternative species? Um, there's a lot of ways to go about it. There, like, there's, a, there's an abalone farm uh, on, the, on the Kona Coast, on the Big, the Big Island abalone uh, farm, and they are able to um, commit to an all-algal uh, uh, production strategy, just like us, they grow all their own algae. They grow mo mostly, mostly the dulse, um, in very, very large, uh, algal ponds. They, they grow, they, they, they grow, uh, spectacularly good products. Um, there are, there are cool things that you can do, um, with seaweeds too, right? Like, I mean, um, the, the gut of the abalone is, is, similar in some ways to uh, the rumen that you would get in, in, a, in a cow, uh, like in, in, in the sense that 
the seaweeds by themselves don't have that much in the way of like these high quality amino acids and proteins that make up a, like a, an abalone foot. Like the abalone, the meat of an abalone is one of like the most complete um, uh, uh, arrays of amino acids that you can get. It's a wonderful, wonderful source of very high quality protein. That's not just, that doesn't come directly from the seaweeds. Those amino acids don't exist in that diversity in the seaweeds. They're built by the bacteria that live in the abalone gut. So there's a lot of really cool things that you could do with diet and seaweeds that maintain that fidelity to algal inputs without necessarily being, um, you know, having a, a massive supply of fresh seaweed. You could make, you know, fermented uh, kind of concoctions of, of like pre, uh, pre-fermented probiotic seaweed type pastes that could be very, very viable in, a, in an abalone production system. Um, the thing that's really key in my mind is keeping the, the cycle very, very local, um, using, using the seaweeds that are, um, you know, cultivating or, or sustainably, uh, uh, harvesting seaweeds that are sort of within the sort of coastal ecology where the farm is, is located. That, that to me is the, the, the puzzle piece that kind of like glues the whole thing together. But I think it can be done. I think it, it can be done even with, uh, without the ability to go out and, and harvest um, massive tonnages of kelp in, in Northern California. You could still maintain that fidelity to a seaweed, um, uh, a seaweed input basis. Thank you very much for that, Doug. We might move on. There are, well, is it a quick question? The question was how successful is the purple urchin feeding um, that you're doing there in terms of sales and acceptance? We've we've had amazing feedback. We've had incredible feedback. And the, the replicability of the flavors that we've been able to create in the urchin row with the seaweed inputs has been really, really encouraging. There are, there are things, there are little, uh, things that are remaining uh, puzzle, puzzles that need to be solved. Uh, there's a great deal of seasonality. They get really spawny at certain times a year and the row is very, very soft. Um, but outside that little seasonal window, we've, we've been able to uh, achieve a high amount of, uh, a really desirable amount of consistency and flavor and yield um, using, the, using the all seaweed input. Uh, and it takes about 10 to 12 weeks to go from uh, uh, a, a purple that comes off the barrens and is as empty as empty can be to a, a market viable um, five nice plug, you know, slabs of, of, of uni row. Um, it's very encouraging. I think that there's a, there's a huge amount of like a clear sky ahead of, of this project. And, and as I said, this is we're we're all in on open source for this urchin thing to work. I mean, it needs to be replicated up and down the coast. It, it needs to move millions and millions of urchins. And every one of those things that just gets thrown into a landfill to me represents a lost opportunity. Would really, really like to see the purple urchin thing um, drive forward. Okay, thank you very much, Doug. Please join me in thanking Doug. So um, that is an excellent segue to our next speaker. Um, so last but certainly not least is Peter Strachbenega. He's an aquaculturalist uh, extraordinaire in California. Um, and he is most recently the operations manager of Urchinomics, which is one of our um, latest uh, aquaculture entrants in the state. So Peter, please take it away. How do you advance just the okay uh, thank you very much uh i think everything's been said about 10 times over so we're going to go through this pretty quickly um but i'm going to do two things one is i'm going to concentrate on the urchins first and then second i'm going to make the case why um what 
uh, Fort Bragg is trying to do is really a needed component to moving aquaculture and blue economy forward. Um, I've been involved in aquaculture for many years. I started off with catfish, raising catfish in Imperial Valley. Then I went to uh, uh, salmon ranching for a little while. Then I did sturgeon for a while and did um, giant uh, keel limpets. And now I'm involved in um, urchinomics. So urchinomics and, and Doug is an amazing, um, who we just heard, um, but there's a lot still to be figured out in in urchin ranching. Um, you've, the problem, you've seen the problem, just you land up with empty urchins. You see what, we've all seen pictures of the barrens. Our model is to um, remove the urchins, ranch them, um, sell them, and pay the divers back to uh, remove more urchins and then work, you know, get the kelp restored. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because one group can't do it by themselves. So it, and as Doug said, there's a lot of moving parts to this and it needs a partnership. So what we see as a sort of ideal working model is that an NGO works to lead the restoration effort to pick where is the most important spot to do the restoration that gives the best yield in opportunity for kelp to come back. And they, the divers work at the direction of the NGO because they're the experts out in the water. We take the urchins, um, do the ranching. Um, we work with every, both the NGOs and um, urchinomics or who, you know, whoever works with universities because there's a lot of research that still needs to be done on, on this species. Uh, and we need the help of the regulatory uh, people. So as uh, Grant Downey's working with the Nature Conservancy on trapping, if that works, that has the opportunity to lower the, the cost and improve the uh, efficiency of getting the source of the urchins. But it's gonna take the regulators to approve that before it becomes a, a reality. Uh, You've all seen pictures of urchin barons. You've seen empty urchins. Uh, as we've heard before, that it's a problem that's worldwide. You see the problems in Alaska, Canada, California, Norway, Japan. Um, here, the, pro the problem is the purples, of course, here, um, which is a real problem because of all these other species that are being, uh, that are being worked on worldwide. They've got a history of being worked on from a perspective of as an uh, target species, as an aquaculture species. So work's been done on them. The biology is understood. The purple is really not understood. We've worked with San Diego State. We've worked with Jacob Bay Marine Lab. We all have the same problems as Doug, Doug alluded to. Uh, spawning is a big issue. So you don't have a product that's available year round because it turns absolutely to mush, the, uh, the product does. So we just have, we're trying to, anywhere where there's the potential for uh, urchin barons, uh, we're working at trying to establish at least um, prototype facilities or research facilities to try and address the problem. And we do have a proprietary diet, but it's all made from farmed seaweed uh, in Japan. Um, and wherever we've tested uh, worldwide, this diet versus natural diets like kelp or seaweeds, this is significantly faster without um, um, uh, jeopardizing the quality of the, the uni. And as Doug said, you can see that uh, it, it eight, in about eight weeks, eight, nine weeks, go, they go from empty to pretty full. So this is um, a restored site in Golden Co uh, Cove, California, so there's an urchin barren, and this was monitored, and you can see three weeks later, after the urchins have been removed, kelp starting to come back, and four months later, you have a kelp forest. And I'm happy to report that we've been doing this now for about six months. Our divers picked three spots off of the Santa, uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel, <clears throat> two off of um, Anacapa, one off of Santa Cruz, and just removed the large urchins and is seeing kelp coming back, reaching the surface. And he's actually able to now uh, fish for 
or die for um, reds because they're now um, have food to to eat and now they're they're full again so we're very optimistic and and that goes back to the question we've seen um, good ocean conditions why isn't the kelp coming back uh, we don't know if this will happen if there isn't good ocean conditions there's so much work that still has to be done uh, but it's going to take a collaborative effort and we've seen pictures of that so now i'm going to look at at the california aquaculture industry and just give you a really 30,000 foot um, perspective uh, this just keep the uh, screenshot in mind here this is a very successful um, uh, sturgeon, largemouth bass, carp, and catfish farm in the Central Valley. Um, so the the fresh the industry is divided basically into freshwater and saltwater. It's plants or animals, invertebrates or vertebrates, and you see here the list of the primary species uh, that are raised in freshwater. Um, they are uh, lots of other very small niche species that are raised, but um, these are the primary ones. And then we've, see, we've heard about the oysters and there's some mussels and abalone and obviously seaweeds being raised in, um, in the marine culture side. What's unique about the difference between the two is that they all develop niche markets. We've heard that word over and over and over again, niche markets. A hundred percent of the fish that are raised in fresh water are sold into the, the ethnic markets or for stocking lakes. And they receive premium prices for those, those products. Um, and that's what allowed the industry to develop is because of that niche marketing. On the marine side, we've heard Doug, we've heard Hog Island, same thing. They found niche markets and developed those niche markets. Um, but what they try to do is avoid, uh, as soon as you start processing, you land up having to compete with foreign product at either coming from out of state or out of the country. And that's really tough to do uh, here in California. Abalone, as to here, just two examples. Abalone was developed here in California, UC Santa Barbara mostly. Uh, we've seen the statistics. So in the 70s, we saw the graph before, about 20,000 metric tons were harvested in the wild in the 1970s. This is worldwide. Uh, by 2017, it's fallen to 7,000 metric tons. In the 70s, the farm production of abalone was virtually zero. But by 2017, it's grown to 174,000 metric tons. So aquaculture was able to create a, a market, you know, approximately almost eight times what the wild harvest was by itself because of availability and consistency. But where does that abalone come from? Of that 174,000 metric tons, 100 and almost 140,000 metric tons come from China, which is 80% of all the product. And you can't see it underneath, but the Calif but uh, the United States, which is Hawaii and California, contribute maybe 0.1% of the total um, uh, supply of abalone worldwide. Sturgeon, again, pioneered here in California in the 1980s. Where's the production coming from? Oh, sorry, went, went too far. And China, it's about 83% of the world's production of sturgeon. So as soon as you process, you're, you're dealing with competing with those, those imported products. And for caviar, again, China is about 31%. US only accounts for about 5%. Even though it was developed here, we had to jump start on the entire industry worldwide. We've fallen way behind. Why is that? Uh, when I ran the sturgeon farm, here's a list of the permits and licenses I had to have and operate under and maintain. And all of those came with a cost in terms of paying a fee each year. It came in with a cost in terms of monitoring, reporting. Um, you, you can't get to running a farm and complying with this 
as a, as a small self proprietorship. It's impossible. So if you look at what the difference is between inland farming, freshwater and marine, if you're looking to develop a farm inland, you have, you have to have access to a private piece of private property. Either you own it or you can lease it from somebody else. You have to have access to water. Either you have a water right from a surface um, source or you have um, a well. Then you get a, a fishing game, fish and wildlife aquaculture permit. You might have to get a discharge permit. And there's maybe a few local permits that you might have to get, but, but you're up and running. We saw in sunken seaweed, we, we saw, you know, we've already seen the list of all the um, agencies you have to go through to get the permits to do something on the coast. It becomes prohibitively expensive. And we've seen that before. Um, in the best case, it's going to take you two to three years to get a permit and three hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars in consulting costs, legal costs to actually develop, get the, just get the permit to start the construction of your project. The lesson is that the industry, there's been spectacular failures with names that you know, Coca-Cola, Kraft, Campbell's Foods, Campbell's Soup, Weyerhaeuser, um, Simplot, all big names that wanted to get into aquaculture in the United States each of them spent millions and millions and millions of dollars and failed spectacularly because they had to compete because they did it on a large scale. They didn't develop niche markets. They had to compete with foreign imports and got slaughtered. The industry in California grew from small farms. You have heard it over and over again, starting small, finding niche markets, growing their product, growing the market, growing their product, more of their product to meet that demand and getting premium prices. But as soon as you can, the catfish industry, like I said, is 100% live. You, if you process catfish in the state of California, you're only going to get about one fifth of the price that you get for that catfish live. And so the industry is for for um, Fort Bragg, for Marine, for the, the the mill site, the advantage is if you're trying it, we've heard it from from uh, sunken seaweed. They don't have five. A small business doesn't have five hundred thousand dollars to start the permitting, start the permitting process, and that's optimistic. I've known of people in Abalone twenty five years ago that spent two and a half million dollars to get the permits. And it took them five years. You can't succeed at doing that. That's what the Port of San Diego's advantage is. That's what the port um, in Eureka is. And that's what the opportunity is here in Fort Bragg is to give those small, um, innovative um, entrepreneurs the opportunity to uh, start an operation find those niche markets and grow. Um, it, it, it does not work, generally speaking, yet. And we know up in Eureka, you've heard of uh, Nordic that's trying to uh, build a big aquaculture uh, uh, land-based um, salmon. We'll see if they're successful. They haven't been successful yet anywhere in the world, but it's something that they're moving towards, uh, towards because of economics, because of problems with um, growing uh, salmon in, in net pens in the ocean. Um, and so uh, ultimately that probably will have to be, uh, work. But um, for Fort Bragg, the, the model should be to present opportunities for small entrepreneurs to come in and use this as an incubator to jumpstart and find those niche markets and uh, give them uh, the opportunity not to have to spend time and money to get the permits that, uh, like we've heard um, in Hawaii, come in, it's ready to go within a, literally a day and then take off from there. And of course, that's the aquaculture park in, in uh, Hawaii. 
And so we are ready to help uh, Fort Bragg however um, we can, Urchinomics. Uh, it's, we, we, we know that purple urchins, it, it's a problem. Uh, we can, we solve the problem by ourselves. Absolutely not. This is going to take a community. Everybody's going to have to work together to make this work. And so um, uh, we're, we're happy to help and do whatever we can uh, just to be successful for Fort Bragg. Because this, as I said before, this is ground zero for the, the uh, urchin problem. And um, hopefully we see the kelp come back soon. So thank you very much. So, because we're definitely a little bit over the time, if you have any questions for Peter, please find him later. But um, just to wrap up in terms of aquaculture, um, I hope this was uh, informative and resourceful for all of you. And as Peter mentioned, Genomics, and I'm sure all of the speakers, as is C Grant and people at Fort Bragg would be more than willing to um, continue this conversation and provide any further information. Personally, I mean, I get these calls all the time of, you know, mom and pop businesses calling me up saying I'd like to do aquaculture. I explain to them, I show them those lists that you've seen, and that's the last time I ever hear from them. I would love to be able to direct them to a place like Fort Bragg and say, here's a place where a lot of that work's already been done. And that, that way they can, they can work out whether aquaculture's for them or not. But um, again, thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to the, um, all the staff at uh, the city of Fort Bragg, um, C Grant and, and all of you for, for coming. I think Sarah might have a, uh, a couple of words to say as. No, just, I want to just get Kevin up here with you. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin's part of this. Um, but yeah, just thank you very much. This has been a, um, a, an exciting, exciting thing to be part of, and we, we hope that um, it can go further. Um, Kevin, Sarah? Please, I'm going to just do yeah. the reception right. part. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, thank you, everyone. I want to thank all of our speakers again. Um, this was, I think, very successful. Um, it was really great to have Betty Yee here talking about the re-economy and just the concepts and the ideas that were being brought forward. I think there's a lot of synergy. There's a lot of energy here. I mean, this is uh, some dynamite right here that you have in Fort Bragg. So um, I this is there's a lot of really cool opportunities here. Um, like Luke said, yeah. Say some more like Luke said, uh, both of us in California Sea Grant are eager and happy to um, continue helping Fort Bragg and helping any, any of you um, as needed. So please reach out, please uh, get out, reach out to us with any questions, any concerns, and we can help point you in the right direction. I mean, that's what we're here for. It's what we like to do. Um, we enjoy this. This has been an amazing time. Um, so thank you all of you for coming. And Sarah, I'll turn it over to tell us what we're gonna be doing next. So I also just want to do a shout out to all the community members at home watching and streaming and those of you that are going to be watching the archive footage of this. Um, there's a lot that we all learned and I know I'm going to be watching the presentations again myself and looking at all the slide decks. Uh, so thank you all for participating. Um, we're going to be leaving here to go up to our guest house museum. Uh, there's a lot of rooms with a lot of fun history to look at. There's also uh, showcasing all kinds of aquaculture products. We have from the cultured abalone farm, we have red abalone and purple urchin, Monterey Bay seaweeds. We have these, the chef is really excited. I haven't tasted them yet, but sea grapes, which is a type of seaweed and some sea lettuce and ogo. And then um, we have Hog Island donated to us uh, a bunch of their really delicious barbecue oysters with this bourbon chipotle butter. Um, Goldeneye Winery and Rotor um, donated some wine. And so that's what's happening up the hill, but it doesn't stop there. Because when you're done up there, you walk across the street to the Noyo Discovery Center. You can check out their geodesic dome where you can literally like get in with your clothes on, but feel like you're under the water and see what the difference is between being in an urchin barren and being in a kelp forest. They also have a really neat um, killer whale in there, a skeleton that's really neat. And they'll have beer, so. 
And then you'll walk around up our in our little downtown here, you'll walk up the block and we have a really, really neat arts organization called Art Explorers. They work with developmentally disabled adults doing a really amazing artwork and they put together an entire uh, show of marine art. I think they called it Ocean is Love or We Are Ocean, one or the other. And they'll have um, some dessert bites for us to eat. And so just enjoy, keep hanging out, keep talking. The conversations have been great. Those of you that are at home watching, now's the time to leave your house and come downtown and meet all of us and, and keep, keep talking. Okay, that's it.